fastidiado el mando, ¿eh? Esperamos, yo no, yo no escucho mi Cuando nos diga eh, Beatriz. Welcome to everybody. Uh, thank you for for the for the colleagues that are here at the Fundación Rafael del Pino to our symposium on geopolitics and economics of climate change. Uh, the Spanish IMD Alumni Association and the Fundación Rafael del Pino uh, are very pleased to organize this uh, this event. Um, funda uh, I would like to thank particularly the Fundación Rafael del Pino because they have provided us, us the facilities and also the streaming facilities for all those who are just attending this symposium on, online. Uh, we would like also to thank our, our alma mater, uh, the IMD School in Lausanne, um, for uh, projecting this event for all our, our global alumni, and also uh, in particular to Professor uh, Smeders, who has just traveled to, to be with us uh, this afternoon and this evening. Uh, for those who are not uh, uh, part of the IMD community, uh, just to, 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 to say a few, a few words about the IMD. The IMD is, the, is a very famous uh, business school in Lausanne and also in, in Singapore uh, with an impressive faculty and uh, who is uh, 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 the top of the ranking in executive education. We are very proud of, of the school. And our association here in Spain is a small association of the alumni in, in the IMD alumni here. Uh, uh, and our purpose is just uh, to provide good conversations about the matters of most interest for uh, key decision makers and for the leaders of organizations. We, as, uh, as uh, uh, the alumni associations, we are part of the Rider Club of Spain who is a, a meta as association of 32 business schools uh, of the highest quality around the world. Uh, all, of, all of those al alumni have been also invited, and I, I, am, I know that most of them are also connected online. What is the aim of this symposium? The aim is just to look at the implications of climate change. I understand that all the professionals that we are joining uh, here today we, we know uh, what is going on regarding climate change, the impact of the human civilization on nature and on the biosphere in, in general. Uh, but there is a key challenge uh, regarding uh, climate change, and we would like to make an approach under three different um, dimensions, which are totally complementary, and those dimensions are the geopolitics, the economics, and the transition. And we would like, and, and you will see uh, with the presentations of, of, of the panelists, that they will also cover two other key elements in this, in, this, uh, um, in this matter, which are very, very important. One is innovation and the other is adaptation. We will start with Mira, Mira Milosevic. Milosevic. I am not going to make big introductions of, of the, of the panelists because I am sure you, you already know about them, and you have uh, Google uh, uh, and seen um, uh, the, the lot of experience they bring to this conversation. Mira will look at the geopolitics regarding climate change. Mira is one of our more respected researchers on geopolitics and international affairs in Spain, uh, mainly as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, part of the real um, Instituto Orcano, uh, our top think tank and one of the top think tanks in, in Europe. And also she, she, she lectures at the EA University. Quick question for, for her will be, are the current state and trends in geopolitics aligned with the uh, imperatives to, to overcome the negative effects of climate change? Are the geopolitics help or... or or just uh, another challenge for the, for the climate change challenge. Um, then we will have a, a presentation from Carl, Carl Smeder, 
who will look at the economics uh, side of, of the problem. Carl is a professor of finance at our school, at IMD, with a deep knowledge of the intersection of finance and sustainability. Carl will present his ideas on how certain developments in economics are needed to support the sustainable uh, economy and to internationalize, to internalize the uh, externality cost of the transition. And Jaime, uh, finally, is a top executive uh, and leader of an energy company group like uh, Repsol, with a background on looking at science to guide the, the energy transition. Jaime will present on what are the key elements to achieve a realistic energy transition and what, is, uh, what are it, its implications for the economy and the society as a whole. The, the symposium will be uh, a presentation, then uh, we will start with Mira. Uh, after her, her presentation, we will have two or three questions. Then we will have the Carl's presentation, the same, other questions, and then Jaime. And finally, we will have a panel with the three of them, and I would like to ask uh, uh, all of you, yes, please, to uh, prepare for difficult and uh, a lot of questions for that panel. All the people attending online, um, uh, you can submit the, all your questions uh, to our uh, email of the association, which is Spain at alumni.imd.org. And this is your turn, uh, Mira. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good afternoon for everyone, and first of all, thank you very much, uh, Fernando, for inviting me to, to participate with another two very important panelists, and uh, of course, uh, as always, it's a great pleasure uh, to be in Fundación Rafael del Pino, and I will uh, get opportunity to also to, to give my thanks to Vicente Montes, who is here, the CEO of, uh, of La Fundación Rafael del Pino, and Fundación Rafael del Pino helped us to, to organize this, this event. Before I, I start to talk about, uh, about um, geopolitics and, uh, and about the challenge of climate change and geopolitical change, I, I will start with with a small confession. I, I, I started to interested in geopolitics of energy uh, when I learned that the Tsar Nicholas I said that the uh, Russian Empire only has two allies, uh, its army and its navy. Vladimir Putin <coughs> said that Russia has only three allies, its army, its navy, and its gas. So I said, this is a really a huge geopolitical question. And then I, I started to interested in, in this link between energy and geopolitics. But I want to say that when we talk about Russia, always this link between geopolitics and energy uh, was the important one, but I think that, uh, uh, that people we more clearly see it uh, since the, uh, the war in Ukraine started last year. So I will focus on three questions. Uh, Fernando really gave us a, a lot of very difficult questions, and I think that you are here for, for ask for it also. But in my first presentation, uh, I will focus on, on three basic questions. The first one is, how the war in Ukraine is changing uh, the geopolitical and political, economic and energy landscape. The second one is the impact of the USA and China relations on energy markets. I, here I, I have to say that I will talk about more geopolitics than the, the increasing prices of energy and how it influences it. And the third question is energy security versus climate change and prospects from the international uh, com community regarding uh, compliance of the Paris Agreement targets. There are huge questions, all of, of, of these three uh, basic questions, what, what I said. So I will try to synthesize and I will try to highlight the, the most important uh, 
um, statement about these these uh, free free questions. So let's let's start with the war in Ukraine and how the war in Ukraine is changing geopolitical, economic, and energy. Uh, landscape. One of the first consequences, and we have seen it last Mar uh, March and last year in 2022, uh, after the votation of the condemn of the Russian invasion of Ukraine in United Nations, the huge majority of the countries of the world condemn, of course, the Russian invasions. But only 16% of the of the world population, you can see here in this map, only 60% uh, of the global population imposed economic sanctions. The, the truth is also that these 16% uh, of the global population produce almost six, uh, 62 uh, percent of the uh, world GDP. Here in this map, we can see how the 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 world is divided between the west and the rest uh, theoretically theoretically all countries more or less condemn the invasion but uh, in the end of the day only 16 percent of the world population imposed sanctions uh, to to russia so uh, in in this uh, in this picture, in this map, uh, a part of this uh, division between the West and the rest, of course, we can open the discussion about uh, what is inside of, of the rest. No? Uh, the Western analyst uh, called the, the, the rest with a very, I think, wrong concept, the concept of the global south. I said that is the wrong concept because global south is the concept uh, in uh, in studies about the post-colonialism and uh, uh, the main uh, aim of this concept is to describe uh, sub-development countries and uh, third world. So to put in the same uh, uh, group, for example, uh, China and the countries of Latin America or the countries of the Middle East, I think that is really very wrong. But we are using this concept of the uh, of the global south and uh, is the same concept which uh, the Kremlin and Russians uh, defined as the world majority. So this world majority is marked by uh, its opposition to impose sanctions to Russia, but also it is marked with uh, more stronger relationship between China and Russia. I am not talking about the alliance in sense of the, for example, the Atlantic alliance, but yes, I'm talking about uh, the, the strategic partnership and what one Chinese uh, colleague told me, uh, the, the, the best way to describe Russian and Chinese relationship is to say uh, we are not always, uh, we, we not always go together, but we are never be against each other. This is uh, really a, a summary of the, of, the, of the relationship between China and Russia and, uh, in, one, uh, in one sentence. Another consequence of the Ukrainian war, uh, and I'm talking about geopolitical and political consequences, is clear, uh, it is clear that the transatlantic relationship is much more stronger, uh, the relationship between the, the European Union and the United States. And of course, uh, it, the, the NATO is stronger uh, in the sense that uh, President Trump said that uh, the NATO is obsolete and President Macron said that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Atlantic Alliance is suffering the, uh, the death uh, and, and coma and so on. So in, sense, in this sense, uh, what is uh, important to to memorize, I always said to my students, I'm talking a lot, but you have to learn this. <laughs> I think that what we can learn already uh, about the, the war in Ukraine is this division between the West and the rest. 
which is the way uh, I think that the world uh, international world order is headed to multipolar world order where, uh, where the great power competition will be one of the most important uh, elements of it. It is the, the war, bipolar world or uni, unipolar world is completely over. So we are in the moment where the reconfiguration of the distribution of power in geopolitics in the international world order is what is going on now. And we still do not know uh, what will be the final uh, result of, of it. Also, the second good and great election is that the Atlantic Alliance uh, in, in, uh, at, at the, on, the on the start of this century, uh, there was a, a joke which said that the Atlantic Alliance is solution which is looking for the problem. <laughs> now, finally, the Atlantic Alliance has a huge problem and we can say that the NATO has back to its primitive role, what, uh, which is the, to the containment of the Soviet Union and now uh, Russia. Uh, but to understand the, uh, the dynamics of the new geopolitical context, and I will uh, very, in, in a few moments, I will talk about the energy in this uh, in this uh, geopolitical context, because this is the, the topic today, uh, I, I would like to put a framework uh, just to, uh, to understand this new situation. Of course, that this new situation is marked by, by risk, by uncertainty, by volatility in economic and geopolitical terms, but also uh, if when, when in, in 2000, until, at least until the, the financial and uh, uh, economic crisis of 2008, we have been talking about globalization and we uh, have been talking about the competitive globalization. Uh, during the pandemic, we have been talking about the disglobalization, but now clearly uh, how this, this this uh, map tried to, to show is that we are talking about division. We are talking about division and also we are talking about, di uh, about the diversification. Uh, All these countries which uh, said that they don't want to impose sanctions to Russia, they really affirm that their main object in foreign policy is to diversify uh, <laughs> their uh, foreign uh, uh, relations and that they just don't want to be part of any bloc, of any, they don't want to have uh, uh, strong alliances with United States or Russia, nor China, of course. Uh, so we are going to the multipolar world order with this diversification <laughs> and divisions. And uh, for uh, economics and, uh, and energy in this context, of course, is, is not good. Uh, is not good context for, uh, for, doing, uh, for doing business. Uh, now I will, would like to focus uh, on Europe. And I think that in all this uh, context of the war in, in Ukraine, Europe is uh, the big loser. The big uh, winner is the United States because the United States is uh, uh, recovering its image of the great power, of the leadership. Also, the United States is making a, a a lot of money because of exportation of LNG, because of, of uh, uh, its uh, energetic, the, the business of energy, generally speaking, Europe is here the big loser of, of the war in Ukraine for different, uh, different uh, reasons. The first one is that we uh, can see, uh, first of all, the end of Ostpolitik, Ostpolitik uh, was uh, a policy uh, which the Western Germany uh, tried to, re during the Cold War, Western Germany uh, uh, try to, uh, to, 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 to have a closer political relationship 
throw good economic relationship and after the Cold War, all Europe trying are, <clears throat> have been trying to, uh, to make a business with Russia with the idea to attract Russia to our economic model and throw this uh, economic relationship to improve political uh, relationship. Now we, we can say that uh, that is completely failed. So it is uh, here we have the end of host politic and the biggest symbol of this end is the uh, pipelines of Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 and this uh, the, this end of the German uh, interdependence between Russia and Germany, but also not only Germany uh, and other parts and other countries of the European Union. For me, what is here the most important problem and maybe the problem which we have to, to, to most to worry about it is the end of the German model. Because German is a driver of, of the European Union as economic power, but also uh, Germany is always a country which marked uh, very decisively all past, present, and will mark a future of Europe in geopolitical and, of course, political and economic sense. So when I said that, the, that this is the end of the German model, I mean that uh, the German model is uh, uh, to have a cheap gas from Russia, uh, to uh, invest uh, this, uh, this gas uh, to, to develop its uh, huge industry and then uh, to develop, of course, a huge uh, industrial exports. And to all of this, we have to add also a low cost security and defense because of the German Nazi past and of course because of the security and defense umbrella of the of the united states so this model which i, I think that this model is uh, just is finished for all european countries but the uh, germany is a paradigm of this model and maybe a country which invented this model so here a first huge question and uh, uh, and a big problem is in which way Germany will adapt itself for in this new European uh, order and also uh, in which way Germany will uh, adapt its uh, industry, its energetic de dependence, and in, uh, in simply speaking, how Germany uh, will, uh, will try to conserve its status of the the principal driver of the of the European Union economy. Uh, why Europe also, I said, that is a loser? Because uh, last 10 years we have been talking about the uh, strategic autonomy of the European Union. Uh, the, the war in Ukraine really uh, uh, shows that uh, there is no security defense of Europe without NATO, and there is no NATO without the United States. So uh, this interdependence of the European Union with the United States is, uh, in context of the war in Ukraine, is really uh, is deepening. And uh, for that, I said that we are in, situ in, sit in sit situation to say goodbye uh, to strategic economy in the area of the security and defense. There are a lot of things uh, in which we can talk about strategic autonomy, but in, in terms of security and defense, uh, the dependence of the United States is, is deepening. And uh, as uh, the, the last summit of, of the Atlantic Alliance in, in Madrid last year in June, uh, showed that uh, NATO really back to, to have uh, its, its uh, uh, a reason the letter, new strategic concepts show that Russia uh, back to be the main preoccupation of NATO, but also we can uh, and have to add to this preoccupation uh, China. Now is, uh, I, I, I wanted to make this geopolitical introduction because uh, geopolitics and link between geopolitics and energy always was very strong. 
now maybe is stronger because we uh, have been starting to, call, to talk about the climate change and we have been starting to introduce a new model of economy, new model of, of business, and of course a business of, uh, of this uh, climate change and transition, energetic transition. So the war in Ukraine also, of course, uh, has a huge impact in, in global uh, economic economies, e, uh, of course, in the model and what we try to, to, to talk about it today uh, in this relationship between uh, geopolitics and, and climate change. First of all, uh, we have to highlight that the energy crisis started before the Ukrainian war. Inflation, inflation, uh, inflation due to the high energy prices also started before the Ukrainian war. Ukrainian war only accelerated this, uh, this uh, phenomenon. And uh, one of the, of the most direct uh, uh, consequences of the war is uh, a food crisis. Uh, also, the, the, um, the crisis of, uh, of refugees, but in, in the European Union, uh, the most visible consequences of the economic impact is the rising energy prices, refugee crisis, and need to increase defending, uh, spending in, in security in defense. Definitely a huge part of money, of our GDPs, will be dedicated to uh, to the 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 cost of the security in and and uh, defense uh, the um, energy prices uh, price uh, prices has been rising uh, in 2021 after the the coronavirus uh, pandemic and the reasons are are different the most important one is uh, the, that the U.S. Uh, LNG supply disruption in the middle of the, of the year, in 2021, a surge in demand uh, gener generated by the de decarbonization of giants as China and India, uh, gas reserves at uh, rock bottom, which, which was a, a strategy of Russia, uh, before the, the invasion, and finally uh, the war in, in Ukraine. So what I want to say that the, the broader picture of the, of the uh, uh, energy crisis before the war in, in Ukraine uh, has already been very complicated, and uh, uh, Russia produce or contribute only with, uh, with around 2% uh, 2 of the, the world GDP, but Russia represents around of 15% uh, of the energy markets. So any kind of, uh, any issue uh, linked with, with, uh, with Russia uh, could produce earthquakes in energy markets. And for that, I quoted what uh, Tsar Nicholas I and then Vladimir Putin talk about the allies of, uh, allied of, of Russia. With that, I wanted to say that Russia has always um, been using uh, energy as geopolitical instrument, as instrument of political influence, and of course of blackmail and, uh, and uh, as an arm asymmetric arm in hybrid wars in, in, in the post-Soviet space. So uh, the war in Ukraine, with all these uh, sanctions, we have already 10 packages of, of sanctions uh, uh, on, on, uh, for, for on Russian government and uh, all institutions uh, linked to, to the Russian government, put Russia in, uh, in position that we can say that uh, Russia has lost a superpower status, at least what uh, in, in its relationship with the European Union. Because the European Union's depends on Russian energy was 27% on crude, uh, crude oil, 41% on gas, and 46, almost 47% uh, on, on coal. So uh, the, the pack different 
packages of sanctions, really in this moment, it looks like that we will never back to do business as usual with Russia. Uh, because really all relationship is broken, but also I can, mm, with common sense, I, even a common sense is uh, the, the less common than an, any sense, <laughs> I have to say that uh, for me it's very difficult to, to think that we will never back to use all these pip pipelines, all these in, uh, interconnections with, uh, with Russia because a uh, lot of money was uh, invested in it and uh, of course Germany is a country which is most uh, interested in. Uh, after all of it I, uh, I can say also that Russia of course uh, has lost its superpower status, status regarding the European Union but is uh, developing a very very fastly uh, a relationship uh, with with uh, China and India, and of course the China and India uh, is uh, are, are getting uh, advantage of this situation and buying uh, energy uh, from Russia with a very uh, modest prices. Let's say in 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 this way. So here uh, some uh, some dates, some some facts. What uh, this is the the, the different um, uh, research of public opinion uh, realized by the energy intelligence uh, kind of uh, consultory of, of England, if if I uh, remember well. So uh, follow this information. The most worrying elements for energy markets in 2003, in this year, will be global economic slowdown and geopolitical uh, tensions. Uh, here, I mean, uh, uh, in, at least in Spain, I think that is much more usual in the United States or Great Britain, uh, huge companies um, have department for security intelligence and they have been talking about the geopolitical risk and so on. In Spain, I think at least last 20 years, only really uh, big, big companies uh, of in, in Spain uh, have been talking about geopolitical risk. Today, uh, I, I think that uh, even much more uh, uh, small companies uh, are worried about it and definitely geopolitics are one of the main dishes in, in everyday life, no? And main, main preoccupation and this is, uh, what uh, geopolitical tensions, this link between global et uh, economic slowdown uh, is, is linked uh, with, uh, with uh, geo geopolitical tensions. So follow this, uh, this research, um, top geopolitical risk of, uh, risks of 2023 is the war in Ukraine and of course uh, Eu Europe's energy crisis. I think that uh, politicians from the from the commissions of of uh, European Commission and uh, oh my God I, I spend almost 35 minutes I'm sorry <laughs> I will I will accelerate it um, uh, politician leader political leaders of the European Union uh, said that uh, that we that is true also that uh, with success we uh, fulfill uh, our objectives to have ener energy reserve reserves and so on but i think that the hour of the truth will be this year and the winter of 2023 and 2024 because uh, a 40 percent of the energy of reserves of energy now is from russia and in this year we will stop to to to, uh, to buy uh, to buy uh, the, the the gas and, and oil from uh, from russia um, if you're interested in 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 uh, the end of the of the ukrainian war you will ask me it's very complicated it will be a long war uh, i would like to spend my last 
um, five minutes <laughs> about the impact on, uh, of this geopolitical crisis of the war uh, in Ukraine on energy transition model. Jaime, Jaime will talk about uh, uh, transition model much more than, than I, but uh, what I want to, to highlight here is that uh, high energy cost cost, in my opinion, will, will accelerate the energy transition because uh, that we are in situation that environmental ambitions will be frustrated in order to secure supply, definitely. We talk about the transition, uh, 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 energy transition. Meanwhile, in Germany, they uh, are open uh, again, uh, carbon uh, centrals of carbon and back to the uh, to the fuels which produced a lot of, of, of uh, CO2. So, uh, in in uh, now, I have, uh, what I want to say that energy security will became the most important issue about energy, much more important than uh, transition. Uh, of uh, an uh, energy transition and that the war in Ukraine uh, is obligating a lot of countries to back uh, to use uh, fuel which is completely opposite to our uh, objectives in, in transition, energetic transition. So this old trilemma, how to achieve security of supply, how to uh, keep prices low and how to protect environment in uh, short term is no longer the absolute priority uh, to protect uh, environment but to achieve sec uh, security of supply. Security will become, I th in my opinion, the main objective all, of all issues around, around uh, uh, energy. I also think that the energy transition is likely to accelerate, first of all, because it is one of the geopolitical case to preserve the liberal international order in sense that we would like to finish this dependence on Russia. This is now a be or not to be question. This is a Hamlet question in sense that the future of the liberal international order in Europe uh, is in shadow or shadow of the uh, on of the relationship between the European Union and uh, and and Russia. Um, I I I uh, mm, will I will stop maybe here in sense. I'm sorry uh, that I talk a lot about Russia, but you can ask me and we have time. I will stop here because we have another panelist. Let's do it. Thank you very much. And, uh, yeah. and um, I have uh, facts about uh, whatever you want, more or less. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Mira. <laughs> listen, listening to you, one uh, gets uh, a bit um, pessimistic about the impact of geopolitics on, on, on the challenges to be overcome for fighting against climate change. Do you think that uh, the current trends are helpful to, to the investments and all the changes needed for fighting the climate change or is, is a, a tough environment on top of the, uh, of the challenge? I think that we are in a schizophrenic situation. We have, on, on, in short term, uh, I'm pessimistic because, um, uh, as I said, in Germany they are uh, they are backing to to to, to use carbon, and and uh, this is a completely opposite uh, of to of our aims in in climate change. But for the other side, I think that there is a. Uh, the, the good, uh, the good uh, moment in sense that never waste good crisis, <laughs> that mm -hmm. we that all crisis is opportunity. So uh, that we will try to accelerate the, the, our uh, uh, instruments and <laughs> measures. Uh, <coughs> we will try to accelerate uh, transi energetic transition 
aiming our uh, objectives to, to full, fulfill our objectives in, in climate change. So I'm pessimistic in short term and optimistic in medium and, and long term. Mm. And definitely what I know, I think there are a lot of in, in investment in, uh, in, uh, in new... Uh, uh, new ways of energy in hydrogen, in, in uh, renewables, renew renewables. Uh, mm -hmm. renewables. So uh, there are a lot of uh, there uh, investment because we had planned before the war in Ukraine, but also, as I said, and, uh, that the future of, of the liberal uh, democratic order depends, at least in Europe, uh, on this... Uh, energetic transition and because of our relationship with Russia, even we are in danger to create uh, dependence of another autocratic states as China or Qatar or Venezuela <laughs> because we want to avoid the one country, uh, Russia, but we have to use, for example, uh, rare minerals from China or we have to import uh, 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 oil from from Venezuela or gas from Qatar. So also is impossible to be uh, to have a high ethics and moral when we are talking about energy and geopolitics. Sometimes we have just to accept uh, dependence of of different actors. But I I, I hope that we will not repeat such a huge, to be such, in such way stupid as uh, the European Union uh, uh, was with, uh, with dependence with Russia. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you, you, you have focused uh, very much, of, for obvious reasons, on the situation in Europe and the war in, in Ukraine and so on. Uh, I know that your presentation, you have also uh, uh, some uh, comments about the relationship of uh, the states and China. But I would like, mm, if you can just say a, a few a few words about that relationship, if China and the United States decide just to, to be, um, to push for uh, achieving the, all the climate objectives uh, for 2050, the world will, will move in that direction. Do you think that they are prepared that th this G2 relationship is going to work in the direction we need for fighting climate change? Um, this <coughs> a personal G2, opinion. My personal opinion uh, is that they could do that, but they will not do that. <laughs> in sense, this is my uh, personal sensation, uh, feeling more. Uh, because I do not uh, crystal ball here and I cannot see it. My, my kit of survival <laughs> not mean to have a crystal ball to pre predict future. But I think that uh, United, the United States and China, uh, both actors have um, more important things. They, of course, they are, uh, climate change is important, but... Uh, uh, and Chinese colleague always said, we are priorities. Uh, of course, climate change is priority, but we have priority before the climate change. And I think that this great power competition uh, will condemn uh, the proposals and the objectives of, of cooperation in this issue, even is the only, maybe one of the few issues where they can cooperate. This is very pessimistic view in, yeah, in any case. Yeah, I'm not uh, pessimistic by nature, but in, the, in no, no, uh, no. geopolitical uh, competition I am, because always distribution of power is where, where uh, geopolitical actors just clash and just want to fight. Excellent. Uh, would you like any, anyone to, to put a question? Let, let's take one, please. No, no, go, 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 go. Sí, no, que vamos a tomar solo una. Sí, sí, please. Thank you very much. My question is um, related to the relationship between uh, um, 
Europe and the United States. I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you refer to the fact that the strategic uh, autonomy of the European Union and this uh, initiative or project uh, <coughs> might not go anywhere in the sense that we might have, we might change dependence from maybe Germany to, to the US. I just wanted to see a little bit more or if you could expand this idea that we were not, I mean, we will be not be able to diversify maybe sources of um, uh, dependency from uh, other countries and and you 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 see only the the avenue in the us and the or in their relationship between the u and the in the us thank you yeah we are in process of diversification <coughs> also above all of our pro energetic providers and uh, germany uh, again is a parad paradigm of this new uh, diversification of providers of energy and but the European Union is a huge uh, bureaucratic uh, institution above all and is very very difficult to achieve consensus about anything <laughs> I mean it's a, a huge process uh, always for that uh, but the, as I said the war in Ukraine shows that EU, the EU depends completely of the United States in security and defense. The main issue here, another um, elephant in the room, and maybe the biggest one, because the uh, security defense is the world one, and uh, since the Second World War, the EU always uh, depends on the e USA. Here, the elephant in the room is the question about technology, because we are... Uh, uh, um, playground of the competition between the, the, the US and China, the European Union, we uh, do not have sufficient innovation. We have regulation. We have uh, a lot of uh, uh, rules because the EU is normative power but we do not have innovation and innovation is one of the key questions in, in this uh, technological great power competition. So the EU will be in situation as the whole institution or 27 countries, member states, to choose the side because um, last five years in the United States, uh, the, the, the politicians talk about that the EU has to choose side between China and the, the United States. And here, this broader strategic autonomy, because when we, uh, I, I mean that people wrongly use the concept of a strategic economy in terms, almost only in terms of security and defense. Even the EU defined nine uh, different areas of possible strategic autonomy. And huge majority of them are or energetic, economic, technological, and so on. So uh, I'm pessimistic here because uh, the EU would like to maintain uh, its relationship with China, with prudence, uh, with uh, uh, studying case by case, and so on. But for the other side, the USA will press every day more because of this umbrella of security in, in defense, like if I protect you, you have to support me in my uh, competition uh, with China. So if we add to, to, to this statement, the American statement, the uh, inability to produce something, to, to have a good innovation in technological terms, I do not see a lot of exit for, uh, for the European Union. And, uh, but maybe uh, the, the war in Ukraine will be the wake-up call. But definitely uh, the U.S. will increase competition with China and will press to the European Union uh, much more uh, to, to have uh, uh, its support. It's a huge topic. <laughs> and, uh, and I already thank you. Talk thank you very words. much, I'm Mira. Sorry. I would like to ask all, all the rest of you who would like to put a question just to uh, to ask it uh, then when we have the panel. Okay, is that all right? So thank you, uh, Mira. And I would like to invite Car Car Smethers. He would like IND to fire me from, from to the talk to talk about economics of climate change. Thank you very much.
Harald. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks to the Foundation for hosting us. Uh, uh, thank you to the local IMD club for having me. Hello, everyone on screen. I can't see you. It's kind of weird here. Um, and uh, actually, um, um, I'm going to start out with uh, something related to what Mira said, namely that there's a complete shift uh, in the attention of business leaders. So now we're going to go from the macro, the geopolitics, to we're going to take it a couple notches further down uh, uh, to business uh, uh, leaders. Um, am I too loud? No, no, okay, okay, because I was, you made me nervous there. So, uh, at the IMD, um, yeah, as Fernando said, we are a business school in Lausanne and uh, Singapore, and uh, we have a World Competitiveness Center, uh, which is led by Arturo Bries, who I know shows up here frequently, a uh, very proud Atletico fan. Uh, and um, so, um, and they do these questionnaires, and so here we, you see the result uh, of, uh, they usually ask a couple thousand uh, managers from around the world, uh, what are the pressing problems? And that's part of their ranking uh, of the various countries, of the analysis they, they do. And so here we see the results of uh, 2021. Uh, in blue uh, is the uh, COVID. And you, we see here in four out of the five countries, the blue bar is the highest. And these are the five countries who are in the top five places of this uh, ranking uh, in 2021. Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, Netherlands, and Singapore. The, uh, uh, the uh, orange one here is environmental su sustainability. Sorry, okay, I am supposed to talk a little. Can we turn this off? Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, maybe this helps. Uh, can you still hear me on screen? So, no, no, you can hear me, I believe that, but the, uh, the problem is the people on, co uh, on, on Zoom. So, um, and we see uh, environmental sustainability uh, is uh, number two, uh, and uh, geopolitics was only in Sweden. Maybe the Swedes knew something uh, from Moscow that we, the rest of the world didn't know. Now in 2022, same procedure. Uh, so here we have a total more than 4,000 C-level executives. Um, only 3% uh, of those answered uh, before February 24, which was the beginning of the war. Number one, inflationary pressures. So inflation was already coming up before we had the energy crisis. The energy problems, it was clear because of uh, the eternal lockdowns in China, supply chain problems were emerging. So that was a big uh, topic already. And then ge geopolitical conflict added, uh, came into the picture in final and supply chain. Those are the top three. Where is, uh, yeah, where are the greenhouse gases? Place number eight. So we see already yeah, in a short term, we see that yeah, managers are looking at what's the big problem right now. Yeah, how do I make it through this uh, year? Um, in the business, how do I get uh, uh, through this? And so where's the hottest fire? And that hottest fire gets my attention, and that's now inflation, geopolitics, supply chain. So we see a complete shift from 21 to 22. Now, I saw this, or I said, well, what do my colleagues know? Yeah. So what, what is one of the big four say? Accenture came out. Uh, with a questionnaire, and they are executives, 1,500 executives. Now, they got the data before the onset of the war, and what are the big problems that business leaders, executives care about? 24% product development, offering new products. 21% financial performance, brand reputation, talent management. Sustainability, a distant fifth place. Huh. So, that's where we are uh, uh, in the world. Uh, sustainability is sort of uh, losing out right now. Now, uh, that's what business leaders have. Now, the youngsters, yes, they are concerned about this, but they will outlive us, and they still care about the environment. So what's the uh, result of that? A huge credibility gap between senior leaders 
and younger employees. Same uh, questionnaire from Accenture. Now they compare the executives, are the same 1,500 executives from the previous chart, but now we also have 2,500 employees. Let's look at the left-hand side. More than two-thirds of executives say, we have a clear sustainability plan. Uh, whatever that means, the sustainability report, we are reducing carbon emissions, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, as, uh, as Greta Thunberg likes to say, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, one in five employees thinks it's uh, more than superficial. That means on the other side, 80% think it's all baloney. I looked at this, and while, yeah, uh, because uh, by, uh, I, I, yeah, as, as a dear friend in the US a long time ago said that I'm uh, among the most uh, guilty people uh, on earth, I have the German guilt, I have Catholic guilt, I have male guilt, white guilt, it doesn't get much worse than me. Yeah, um, uh, yeah so by nature I'm depressed and cynical. Uh, but I couldn't believe these numbers. So uh, at OWP, which is IMD's flagship program, uh, which we have uh, once or twice a year, or last year we actually had it three times, once online, I ask people uh, in my classes, and they all agreed with us. Yeah, 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 this describes our company pretty well. The young people said it, and the older, the executives said, ah, could be the case. Uh, yeah, um, big word now, purpose. Yeah, uh, all the people want to have purpose in life, and people complain it's so difficult to hire young people. We want to give them a purpose. I grew up on a farm. If I had asked my dad, I need purpose in life, he would slap me in the face, kick me in the rear, and says, go and feed the pigs. Yeah, so I fed the pigs without asking him what's the purpose. Anyway, but the young people want purpose. So, now, uh, at this point, usually, I would do a breakout and say, let's have a discussion. I don't have time. Um, so, food for thought, homework for all of you. Questions for the senior leaders in the room. Do you have, with your, whatever you call it, your CSR, your ESG, your sustainability plan, do you really have the entire organization on board? Be honest. What are the weaknesses? Are you addressing the weaknesses? Where are you doing well? And what are you overlooking? Now, an exercise I'm doing these days, whenever I'm in a uh, 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 custom program, that's the IMD word for programs for a particular company, I look at their sustainability report and I shred it in front of them. Yeah, and I, because this is fun stuff, uh, yeah, I don't read detective novels anymore, like who was a murder. Now I look, read at sustainability reports and says, where are the dead bodies? Yeah, and sometimes it's really difficult. Yeah, recently there was a thing where I couldn't find 60% of the emissions. Yeah, luckily the CEO then admitted to them. So, that's food for thought, homework. Yeah, take an honest look at your organization. Now, related to this question, um, I want to talk about the tragedy of the horizon uh, next. What is that? That's really important, and that's what we see, and what Mira was talking about was a great example of this tragedy of the horizon. Beautiful term. The guy who came up with this is Mark Carney. Uh, he gave a famous speech in 2015 in London. Uh, at the time, he was a head of or the governor of the Bank of uh, England. He's now retired. He's now buddy with Greta. Yeah, uh, Greta yells, and he's a brain. Yeah, Greta really needs to go to college and learn some economics and finance. He has a brain. So he had a great speechwriter, talked about the tragedy of the horizon. So I know we have board members in the room. Here's a question. How many bad quarters can a CEO in a company where you are a board member, or if you're the CEO, how many bad quarters where you underperform the market, where you underperform the competition, how many bad quarters can you afford until you get fired? Anna, thank you for the honest answer. I can tell you the number one answer I get, three quarters. Number two answer, I get four quarters. Number three answer, bronze medal, two quarters. 
Good example, Emmanuel Faber, the head of uh, or former CEO of uh, uh, Danone, yeah, super sustainable company, won all kinds of awards. An investor comes in because he's underperforming his yogurts, underperforming the Nestle yogurts, game over. He is now a buddy of Mark Carney and Greta. Yeah? <laughs> So you have the young idealist who is yelling, you have the banker who looks at the economics, and you have Emmanuel Faber, be like me, but not quite. So the problem is that the most powerful people in the world, the most powerful people in Spain, the top 20, top 50 CEOs, yeah, if you have Anna in, in your board, three quarters, and you're dead. Leaders of government, what's the time horizon for President Biden? Less than two years. Less than two years. In 2024, there's another election. Yeah, Trump is already running. Yeah, Nikki Haley is getting in. They are already uh, campaigning again. Rishi Sunak in the UK election in 24. So, and then what, what do we see about the crazy Germans? I can complain about the Germans because you hear from my thick accent, I'm German. Those morons in Berlin pretend to be all green, but now more than 40% of uh, German electricity comes from burning coal and really bad coal, the bad coal from the Rhineland where I come from. Why are they doing it? Because they need to keep energy prices reasonably low so that they hopefully get reelected in their mind. Yeah, so this is a problem. Even, even yeah, the emperor for life, President Xi, was in trouble. Why is he going after Taiwan? Because he mucked up his, uh, his own economy with these eternal lockdowns. And they have problems. And they have a, a real estate bubble and whatnot. So the most powerful people in the world, business leaders, three quarters, uh, politicians, maybe two years until the next election. And then Mark Carney says even central bankers. Yeah, Lagarde is under a lot of pressure. Yeah, uh, yeah, the Germans hate her because we have such high inflation. They say we need to be tougher on inflation. If Trump were still president, Jerome Powell would have long been fired at the head of the Fed. Uh, uh, Biden is too weak. Trump would have blamed the, him for the... the uh, um, inflation. So that's a problem. We have this short-term thinking. And Mira was talking about this. Everyone is now talking about, you know, she said, geopolitics. I say inflation supply chain problems. So therefore now, we all do the sustainability reporting. We talk a green talk. We report all this stuff. This is uh, free of charge. You can go there on HBR. Uh, .org, uh, the article by Ken Packer from now two years ago. Uh, he was a COO of uh, Timberland, uh, uh, American shoe company, and he, they were really early on in the sustainability movement, and he said it's all a failure. We report, we report, we report. You know, the thinking, what gets measured, gets managed, complete bogus. You measure it, you put it onto a glassy brochure, you sell it, or you give it out, or put it on the internet, and then you ignore it. Why are you ignoring it, dear board members? Because you are messing up. You don't understand economics. You don't do economics right. Beautiful book. Don't buy it. It's really outdated. And the guy's a Republican nutcase, Steven Lenzberg. Um, but literally, chapter one of this old book starts as follows. Most of economics can be summarized by four words. People respond to incentives. The rest is commentary. That's the difference between business people or Mark Carney on the one hand and the tree huggers and Greta on the other hand. People respond to incentives. So why are CEOs not doing more? Because they're not incentivized. Sustainalytics rating agencies, this data is, is getting out of date, but they haven't updated it. I looked at it again two days ago. Uh, yeah, still the statistics on there. Who, how many of you in the room have green KPIs as part of your bonus package? Wow, that's a lot. Three. That's a lot. Three out of 20. Wow, 15%. Well, yeah, Spain is green. Yeah, 
I, I, had to, I had the board and the CEO uh, of a company in, in the room last week, and the, the CEO made a zero. And I said, you see, board, why should he be green? So other than the three weirdos in the room, yeah, uh, yeah, from the weird employers, why should you do anything? You're not incentivized. Yeah, look at this. The one thing that's big is occupational health and safety. We had a big uh, brown uh, um, uh, mining company, and the CEO proudly said in my class, Carl, I got my full bonus on uh, OHS, occupational health and safety. Uh, well, why is that? Uh, and he says, oh, nobody died in our mines last year. Yeah, that's a high standard. You are laughing. You don't know this, yeah? Fernando and I have a deal. He's going to give me a thousand euros tonight if nobody of you dies. Yeah, in my session right now. Yeah? So, yeah, that's the only deal I have here, yeah? Don't die on me. Yeah? I don't want to go through the paperwork. No, this is a problem. This is a problem. Now, the U.S. makes a big deal that they're doing it. Who is doing it? The biggest companies. Because the biggest, the S&P 500 companies, because they are the limelight. They make a big deal about it. Does it have anything to do with climate uh, change? No. This is all bogus. This is all about S, the social aspect. Namely, more African Americans in senior positions, more women in senior positions, more LGBTQ plus people in senior positions. I had a woman from Caterpillar from South Africa, yeah, but Caterpillar, the American company, and she says, Carl, I would never hire you unless you promise me you're gay. <laughs> and I said, that's a problem. I'm married to a woman. Yeah, she says, then I would never hire you. Yeah. I, I said, yeah, good that I don't want to work for Caterpillar. Yeah, but uh, at the same time, there were a bunch of Muslims in the room from the Middle East. You should have looked at their faces yeah, when I talked to a black woman about me not being gay. Yeah, but that's the kind of discussion they have in the U.S. Yeah, so don't get, if the Americans brag about that they have these incentives, it's all S. Which is fine that they have it, but it doesn't help us with the climate. So, and then once you get out of the limelight, it's, um, it's much less, so the smaller companies. Here's now the big question. Should a company's ESG performance, and in particular the climate change performance, affect, here of course for the headline they say the chief executive's pay. I would say everyone's pay, not just... Mr. or Miss CEO, but the entire C-suite and then through the organization. And so that now gets us to the million dollar question. How do we define fiduciary duty of a company leadership? Milton Friedman, uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner in the US, sort of in the US, the Republicans have three main gods. There's Jesus, there's Ronald Reagan, and there's Milton Friedman. Uh, now, if there is a Jesus, which I hope there is, then Ronnie and Milton are hopefully in uh, hell. Yeah? But Milton Friedman said the shareholder value. It's all about making the shareholder rich. And too many companies still have this. It's all because the board says we only look at yeah, what's the return on investment? Yeah, they look at those five metrics. Does your company have the right KPIs? And does it have green KPIs? I don't have the time to go into details. My biggest client at IMD last year was a big bank in Southeast Asia. They had done something great. The board had given green KPIs to the C-suite, but not to anyone else. That's how you ruin an organization. So then this happened. Yeah, we also had the front people, and in Southeast Asia, some the four-letter word, don't think of the two four-letter dirty words that you think of. The bad four-letter words are coal and peat. Peat is the stuff in the ground, yeah, um, and it's this, this type of ground that's very black. The German word is torf. I don't know whatever that's in Spanish. Uh, yeah. So the peat, when you build shopping centers and you rip the ground out to put concrete in, 
you, a lot of CO2 goes into the atmosphere. So people want to build shopping centers. The loan officers are happy to give you a loan for building a shopping center. So they had a deal with a builder, went to the chief risk officer, and the chief risk officers nixed it. Because that's, that's so bad. Yeah, if our loan, or yeah, that's too many brown loans, it's bad for my bonus. Yeah, but the loan officer doesn't have a green bonus. He or she only has loans given out, like assets under management, loans under management. So the chief risk officer has to walk this direction, and the loan officer walks that direction. Good luck getting the company walking in this direction. Yeah, it's a mess. And so, yeah, um, this is why we're not doing anything. Yeah, if my, if my boss only looks at the return and growth, yeah, I'm not going to do this. Now, um, uh, before, when we were setting up, uh, Fernando said, Think, can you talk about uh, innovation and adaptation? Sadly, I don't have slides on it. I have plenty of slides on them, but not for this afternoon since we get so little time here. Um, it has to do with innovation. Innovation, a lot of innovation, the return comes in later. Do you, if should I, if I'm a CEO, do green innovation where the return on the investment comes in five or ten years? I don't know what the average tenure of a CEO in Spain is. In the FTSE 100, the average tenure of a CEO is about five and a half years. So if I become CEO of a company in London, I know in five to six years is my average life expectancy in that job. So in those five or six years, I have to cash in that afterwards I can sip Kuiperinias in the Bahamas for the rest of my life. And ideally, my kids can do that too. Yeah? And my grandkids can do it too. So I want to cash in on my bonus. Am I going to invest into super long-term investments? No. Yeah, that's good for the next CEO. So that's a mess up. So it's even on the innovation, on green innovation, yeah, I don't have the incentive to do this. Similarly with adaptation. I always complain we're not adapting too much enough to climate change. People tell me why they are not doing it. Because nobody gives them brownie points. Everything is on mitigation on the CO2 footprint. I literally had a CEO who says, Greenpeace yells at us for that we don't do enough mitigation. They don't give us anything if we do adaptation. Oh, then I don't do it. My wife says, Greenpeace, the second part of the name, is definitely a lie. It's unclear whether the first part is true or not. That's up to discussion. And so, therefore, people don't do enough for uh, adaptation. Who is doing a lot for adaptation? Mengo Mussolini. Donald Trump, I always call him Mengo Mussolini. Mussolini because he's a fascist. Mengo because of his looks. Mengo Mussolini runs for president and says climate change is a hoax. But he's putting a wall around his golf course in uh, Scotland because we all learned in middle school geography, salt water ruins any ground. So you can't have a pristine green and put your ball yeah, on yeah, uh, if, if there's salt water on it. So that guy's smart enough. Look at Indonesia. Indonesia has decided to give up on Jakarta because they know with rising oceans they can't save Jakarta. So they're putting six, eight, ten million people going to move up to another island up on a hill. Yeah, that's adaptation, and we need to do more of that. Germany completely effed it up. Yeah, they had this flooding, which was. Yeah, in an area where they weren't used to it, and adaptation starts with warning. But because my fellow countrymen are obsessed with GDPR and security, they can't call people on a cell phone and warn you, you're going to be about to die in a flooding, get the hell out of your house, because they all can't do that. Yeah? Four years ago, I was in, uh, in, uh, for a family reunion on, on my wife's side in, in Canada. I was driving on the highway, and my Swiss cell phone rings with a warning that there's a hurricane coming. 
So in, in uh, Canada, the uh, government is able to reach every cell phone in the country to warn them. In Germany, they still cannot do that. Yeah, Germany is in the dark ages. Uh, that's another, for another discussion. So, now, you need to do more, business leaders. This. Now, what's coming? What is the uh, future that uh, need to get ready? This green transition. We're going to hear a lot uh, on the energy side. I'm going to take a little bit sort of more of a high-level uh, view. Uh, Mira mentioned the Paris Agreement. Forget Paris. It's dead. Paris is dead. Game over. We blew it. Yeah? So, uh, IPCC. Um, for those of you who don't believe in climate change, at the uh, IMD, I meet many people who don't believe in climate change. A uh, good friend of mine uh, at Jesse on the faculty doesn't believe in climate change. It's bad for the car industry. Uh, uh, and so, therefore, he doesn't believe in it. IPCC independent scientists from around the world, they come up with a report, first report uh, in 1988, headquartered around the corner from IMD in Geneva. Um, they just came out with a new report. Median global warming is going to be 3.2 degrees Celsius. That's on the track we are after. Yeah, they even give a confidence interval on that. So within the next five to eight years, we're going to see the first year where average global warming around the globe will exceed one and a half degrees Celsius. That's the average temperature around the globe relative to 1850. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the second point, E4. They say many regulatory and economic instruments have already been deployed successfully. And they ask that these instruments are scaled up and applied more widely. I don't know about you. I have never met a regulator who needed to be motivated. They are a very motivated bunch. Yeah, they sit around thinking, how can I make your life more difficult? And they never run out of ideas. Now, now they are asked to do more. That's a dream come true. Yeah, because now they can say, look at the IPCC. They are telling us to do more of that. So, they started, the first report came out uh, around uh, just before Rio, the Rio meeting in 1992. Uh, and so at the time, we had global emissions of CO2 of 2023 billion, billion with a B, tons. After that, we will see how well these COPs have worked in the last uh, 30 years, straight going up. Uh, just before COVID, we were at 36 billion. On the final exam, tomorrow morning, you didn't know that, right? So, final exam. Uh, two numbers you need to know. 36 billion CO2 emissions, 51 billion CO2 equivalent. You know, the scientists think we are all stupid, so they don't tell us how much methane is out there, nitrous oxide. No, they translate it as if it were CO2. We always need to look at that. In Switzerland, we are obsessed with that because a big part of that is methane. Methane is the stuff when a cow burps or farts, so when, a, when air leaves a body of a cow on the front or back side, a lot of methane in there, and that's really bad. Nestle, the number one problem that Nestle has is scope three emissions from milk, from the milk they buy. Uh, if that's... Uh, that's a killer for them, uh, not, not the electricity they use or whatever they, when they make cereal. So we see now this went through the roof, and I have a goal. I want to be part of humanity when we make 40 billion. Come on, in five years, world record, we can do 40 billion 2028. 20, That's my slogan now. Yeah? I'm going to drive a diesel car. I'm going to contribute. Yeah, and IMD is sending me to teach in Singapore next month. So I'm going to contribute it. 40 billion 2028. Come on, we can all help. Yeah, uh, I'm going to eat meat at dinner tonight. Yeah, so cow meat. Yeah, so big explosion in China, in Southeast Asia, in India. Because, yeah, not because those Chinese are bad people, but because we outsource to them. 
Yeah, it started with a lefty, Clinton, yeah, a NAFTA, yeah, let's kill uh, American manufacturing and go to Mexico. And then Mexico was too expensive, then they went to uh, China. So the Chinese are producing, this is called carbon leakage. This is something these idiots in Brussels don't get. Yeah? Higher regulation, what does a good smart CEO da do if he or she is motivated for profits? Close down manufacturing, Holzim did just that. Close down manufacturing of cement in uh, the European Union and produce instead in Turkey and Ghana. Now, what these idiots, yeah, Saint Ursula of Brussels, yeah, yeah um, the reincarnation of Mother Teresa, I, I call her, yeah, Saint Ursula of Brussels doesn't get that the CO2 from Turkey can come over to Madrid with, unlike you and me, without a passport. Those CO2 molecules, they just show up. Yeah? So, yeah, you are laughing, it's kind of sad because Brussels doesn't get it. So then we put that cement onto a big uh, ocean vessel with really dirty diesel, much dirtier than what I put in my car, and ship it to Rotterdam, put it on a boat, and send it to Basel, and then on a truck to Paris. Great. Yeah, so what is the net impact of that green regulation? Bad. Negative. The net impact on humanity is bad. Maybe we feel good that, that Erdogan uh, uh, pollutes and not uh, 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 in, in, in Germany, Spain, or, uh, Paris or, or uh, France, but it doesn't help. So, now, uh, here, yeah, with, with this kind of audience, uh, I, I may not need this, but I yeah, sort of, uh, what I always try to push is to get away from ethics, morals, values. Yeah, I'm sure you have heard at IMD, big topic, value-based leadership. Yeah, but my values are completely different than of any of your people in the room. I can promise you that. I'm a Bayern Munich member. Yeah, I hate Real Madrid and Atletico. Yeah, so your values and my values are completely opposite. Yeah, so value-based leadership makes me nervous. And at IMD, yeah, there are a lot of people from non-Christian countries, from, from other religions, so values is getting a bit difficult. What did Boris Johnson do before COP? Brought a lot of uh, religious leaders to the Vatican. Oh, we need to bring religion in. No, let's take religion out of this discussion. Let's take ethics and morals out of it. Let's talk about economics. What's the problem? Yeah, is that CO2... Methane emissions are outside of markets. And the technical terms here are negative externalities and we have a market failure. And I'm always amazed how many people that walk through IMD don't know this. Uh, the example I use, yeah, uh, I thought I should take an example far away from oil, uh, um, is cement, because then I can also pick on the Chinese. It's safer here. Yeah, uh, um, so, the, the, on Earth, we produce about 4 billion tons of cement. A production of 1 ton of cement gives us 0 0.3 tons of CO2 in a chemical reaction. Namely, didn't think that you would see a chemical formula at a uh, 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 symposium on geopolitics. Uh, you take limestone, you heat it up to 1,400 degrees Celsius, with that heat, a CO2 molecule gets out of the limestone, we blast it into the atmosphere, and then we get clinker. Clinker is a fantastic thing because that's the sticky part so that you take a brick and you take another brick and you put them together so that you get a wall. I love cement because I'm freezing a lot. So just don't get me wrong. I love cement. So... The problem here is, however, how do you get air to 1,400 degrees Celsius? You burn coal in China. Lots of coal. Or in Germany now the same. And then you get to one ton of cement is about 800 to 900 kilogram of CO2. Holzem can do it at 553 kilogram. But in China, it's almost one-to-one. -one. Is this a problem? 
China produces about 2 billion tons of cement a year, which is about 2 billion tons of CO2. China in two years produces as much cement as, uh, sorry, as much CO2 as uh, 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 from cement production, uh, oh sorry, produces as much cement in two years as the US did in 100 years. So, if now people on the right in Switzerland, our extreme right, says climate change policy is all baloney. We don't need to do this. If the Chinese don't help, we don't need to do this. And that's what Mira is talking about. Yeah, that's why this is so important, geopolitics and the influence. It doesn't matter. Uh, the CO2 emissions of Switzerland are 40 million. Uh, so 50 times all of Switzerland is cement in China. So cement in China, nobody has eaten anything. You haven't had any tapas. I haven't had any chocolate or cheese. Everyone is naked. No cow has burped or farted. Yeah, so it's biology. Don't blame me. Don't blame me. Don't go woke on me. That's biology. So, and we are already 2 billion tons down. 50 times Switzerland. So if the extreme right in Switzerland says, are you freaking nuts with your climate change? We don't need to do anything. If people are fatigued of Brussels, I understand them. I understand them. So, Quick negative externality, we don't pay, or this in green, did not pay for CO2 emissions. It's external to markets. Now, for those of you who by now think I'm a lefty, I'm not a lefty, I'm against all politicians, uh, on the left and on the right. We all learned about the invisible hand. In your studies, whether it's in business school or in undergraduate, you learned about the invisible hand or you heard about general equilibrium theory, or you heard about efficiency, Pareto efficiency. Here's the thing, beautiful theory, lovely academic theory. Problem is, it doesn't apply on our planet. There are assumptions. That's what the dumb Republicans always say. Oh, capitalism. Capitalism is great if some assumptions are satisfied. Everything needs to have a price. If carbon doesn't have a price, if it's outside the market, it's outside capitalism. And then capitalism can't save us. So this is all wrong. It's, it's like a Shakespearean play. It's a beautiful story. Lots of people got the Nobel Prize for it. The great thing about Nobel Prize in economics is you get it's, it's like literature. You get it for fairy tales. It's not like in physics or chemistry where what you show or detect has to be true. That's a great thing about economics. So don't take that Nobel Prize seriously. So the, we have a failure of the invisible hand because there is no pricing of carbon, it is outside. We need to bring carbon into markets, and that's what's happening. I know some of you, I'm sure, suffer from the European Union carbon trading system. Here now, for all of you who have strong political views, yeah, I know in Spain there are strong political views on both sides, the cool thing is you can agree on something. Unfortunately, the dumb uh, Republicans in the US haven't gotten that yet. No matter whether you're extreme lefty or extreme right, economics tells you if you, we need to put a price on carbon. You can call it a carbon tax or this cap and trade agreement. This is from a, this is a Wall Street Journal. Uh, um, uh, opinion piece, economist statement on carbon dividends. I had never heard the word of carbon dividend before. It's, I'm sure, so that the Republicans would sign it. Um, it's only 29 minutes, boss. So, um, and uh, so uh, uh, we have that by correcting a well known market failure. We don't have a market for CO2. And now they also wrote about something. A border carbon adjustment system, they wrote about. This is coming in the European Union. And I hope I, I'm going to get to that point. Because if that shows up, it's going to be a game changer. It's going to be a game changer. I, 
if you want to take a bet, I bet against the European Union. As Mira said, everything in Brussels takes ages, and this has lots of uh, uh, opposing, but I'm going to get to that. I group, uh, so here they had the original signatories. Many of them worked for the Reagan government, for Bush father and Bush senior government. So very extreme right-wing economists plus the lefties are on there. So no matter what your politics, we need to put a price on carbon. The World Bank comes out with a report on that every year. Currently, we have 68 carbon pricing instruments. Quick economics lesson here. Yeah, in economics, we have quantity of a good and the price of a good. When you try to fix both, it's called communism. That doesn't work. Either you pick a quantity and you let the market determine the price, that's cap and trade. We limit CO2 emissions and then we have trading that determines the price. Or we fix the price, a carbon tax, and let people fix, choose the quantity. That's, for example, the case for me when I heat my house in Switzerland. In Switzerland, we have a carbon tax on heating oil and heating gas for heating houses, 120 Swiss uh, francs, essentially the same in euros right now, 120 euros per ton of CO2 that I blast out when I uh, heat my place in the winter. Unfortunately, my wife is a green feminist, and so I'm freezing at home. Yeah? <laughs> it's difficult to be married to a tree hugger. Don't do it. Yeah. So, because then you have to walk the talk. That's the problem. Okay, this is a mess around the world. Um, Europe, we are really front running. Uh, recently, I had uh, a German company headquartered in my hometown of Essen with facilities around the world, and a Republican said, my factory operates in a very business-friendly environment. And all the Germans and even the Chinese were crying. Yeah, they were crying and crying. He says, oh, I want to be the, run the factory in Kansas, yeah, because you can pollute the hell out of, uh, out of it. So, um, China now has a carbon price. Um, here's now the issue. 68 jurisdictions have this. The European Union came in 2005. Why am I telling you all this? Because I know some of you know this. Look on the vertical axis. You may not be able to read it. It says 25%. 25% of all greenhouse gas emissions right now have a price where either a carbon tax or there's a cap and trade agreement where you get permits, have to buy more permits if you want to sell more. So that means three out of four CO2 molecules are not taxed. We know the economic solution to deal with this problem. Put a price on it and let capitalism do the job for us. In three out of four CO2 molecules, we are not doing it. For example, in most of the United States. Do not go to the left coast, the lefties, yeah? California, Washington, Oregon, don't go there. Don't go to New England, Boston, those lefties, yeah? You want to do business in the red states, yeah? Pollute the hell out of them. They don't care. They are happy to die of cancer and whatnot for the good of uh, the U.S. GDP. Yeah, so, or go, or hold them very smart. Go to, go to Africa. Yeah, don't produce in, in, in Spain or Germany or France. Fire everyone. Go where you can pollute. And that's what companies are doing. Why? Because the board says we endorse it. Let's cut down our plans here. Here's now the problem, yeah, so, yeah, that I hear a lot. He says, oh, you green Europeans, we are killing our jobs. Yes, that's true. Uh, the European uh, cap and trade uh, uh, price in 2020 was briefly under $20. It shot up. It was at close to 100 just before the war. Uh, then when the war started, it fell, it fell again uh, last, late last summer. Uh, and people said, oh, we're going into a recession. We're not going to produce as much as we thought. We have enough of these car permits. Now we are selling them. Uh, and now they said, oh, shit, there is no recession coming. 
Yeah, it's, 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 it's this puzzle. Yeah, Switzerland has a record. Everyone thinks the recession is coming, and we have record low unemployment. The U.S. economy, everyone said the recession is coming. Yeah, if you look at the yield curve, it's inverted. That's usually a sign of a recession coming. They just added half a million jobs. And nobody has any idea what the hell is going on. Yeah, shit. No recession yet. Where is the recession? We have to buy the carbon permits because business is going well. I need to pollute more. So I'm buying these carbon permits. So we are close to 100 now. Um, as a, yeah, I got my PhD in market economics. As a market economist, I love this. I love this because this is the economic solution. As a European, this deeply depresses me. Who is benefited the most of the carbon price? The gangster Elon Musk yeah, and Tesla. Why? The car companies get permits to produce cars. Yeah? And if they produce more cars, they have to buy more permits. So Seat or Volkswagen have to buy this if business is going well. Whom are they buying this from, these permits? Because Tesla gets also permits for the cars they are selling, but the cars are so green. Why are they green? Because we don't think about what are we going to do with the batteries in 10 or 15 years. We don't think about this. We don't think, oh, if you drive a Tesla in Germany, you have mostly coal-powered electricity, and so essentially you're polluting. No, Brussels doesn't get that either. And then the son of a bitch, Elon Musk, yeah, Shoots rockets, and this is now where I get uh, get in, where I get really mad. Is our IMD uh, MBAs? Then they travel to Silicon Valley, and when you ask them at graduation, what's the greatest thing of your education? MBA, EMBA? Oh, the trip to trip to Silicon Valley. This innovation. Oh, and I saw the store with Teslas. Oh, Elon Musk is so great. Until. Q2 of 2021, Elon Musk lost money on selling cars. Tesla was profitable. Why? Because it was highly subsidized by the European Union. When I bought my BMW, that was more expensive because BMW has to, yeah, is, is severely punished for this and the European car manufacturers. Tesla sells this by the hundreds of millions of dollars. So this gangster yeah, has been profitable because of subsidies essentially from Brussels. So here's what we're doing. Yeah? So you see, I'm on all sides. We are killing a key industry in Europe, namely car industry. We make their life very tough. We subsidize this idiot who now goes around, oh sorry, who now goes around and says, government is bad, yeah, I'm a Republican, get rid of taxation. Dude, we made you rich. I'm so mad at his damn um, rockets that they don't keep him up there. Go, go, be the first man on the moon. Yeah? Go there. Okay, 38. I have a couple minutes. So uh, here's now the game changer. Carbon border adjustment system, uh, or mechanism, they call it, in, in the European Union. So here's the idea now. Holzim is producing the cement in Ghana. And it's, the boat is coming to Rotterdam. And the European Union is going to say, that damn cement stays on that boat until you pay a carbon tax on that cement. Oh, one ton of cement, yeah, with the technology that you have in Turkey or Ghana, we know that 700 kilogram of CO2, the price is 100 euros times 0.7, we get 70 euros. This is trade war, that's what the Chinese call it, that's what Biden calls it. Because now brown products that you produce elsewhere and are now importing are now getting taxed. This is exactly what all those Nobel Prize winners and those council chief economic advisors of Reagan and Bush and Bush Jr. and Obama recommended. That's what you need to do. And if this comes, we have to rethink international trade. This is going to be a huge amount of reshoring. 
we're going to reindustrialize this. But here is now the question. Yeah? Hopefully, the Spaniards are smarter than the dumb Germans. They do NIMBY, not in my backyard. Yeah? They don't want to produce in China, but they also don't want to produce then in Germany, in their backyard. <laughs> yeah, you have to either do one or the other. Yeah? So, again, uh, here in red, carbon leakage occurs when companies based in the EU move carbon-intensive production abroad, where you have less stringent uh, climate policy. And that's this carbon leakage. And we have done that like crazy. Why? Because the board members, who just ran away, uh, told the CEOs maximize profit. This is supposed to start later this year uh, on cement, iron and steel, aluminium, fertilizer, electricity, hydrogen. Aluminium, Finnish company on campus. In Finland, you can produce one ton of aluminium by emitting half a ton of CO2. Sounds bad. One ton of aluminium, half a ton of CO2. I thought, that doesn't sound good. And the guy says, you have no idea what you're talking about. I said, no, that's true. China, one ton of aluminium, 20 tons of CO2. 20. 40 to 1. This, why the Finnish have a lot of hydro yeah, and better technology. So, I don't know whether it's, it sounded good. Yeah? Uh, so even let's say it's not 5%, let's say it's 10%. This is a game changer. That ton of, of aluminium from China is going to go 20 tons times 100 euros. Minus the CO2 tax they pay in China. If they do pay, it's 45 yuan. What is that? Six, seven, eight euros. So that's going to be a complete game changer. Uh, some, I forgot what job he had, from one of our clients said, should the EU really implement CBAM, then we will see the golden decade of stainless steel in Europe. The golden decade of stainless steel in Europe. They are stainless steel manufacturer from Finland. Someone from the Middle East said, if the European Union attempts to implement CBAM, then we will sue them at the World Trade Organization. So this is why I'm pessimistic, because I'm as pessimistic as Mira about the European Union. Uh, something to get done. Uh, Biden hates this, and President Xi hates this. Last thing, and then I quit. Thought experiment. You are the CEO of a Chinese aluminum or steel manufacturer. Then, first, you had to deal with uh, Mengo Mussolini. China is bad. Trade war. Oh, I'm going to tax you. You are pissed. Then, yeah, Ursula von der Leyen, St. Ursula of Brussels says, yeah, the Lord has given me the power to save the planet, so I'm going to do now a CO2 tax. The CBAM. The effect is exactly the same. You, whether you're dealing with Mengo Mussolini or with the European Union, for you, your costs go up. You are less competitive. And that's where, where we're back to geopolitics. Yeah? Who is going to, yeah? can they push that through? So, but this now means for all of you, yes, I'm sure yeah, you uh, are preparing for more regulation, but here's the million dollar question. How will CBAM affect your organization? Are you, if you're, are you already reshoring? Are you thinking about this? I had this uh, EMBA student from DHL. She hadn't heard about this. I said, we don't need you anymore. We're not going to ship that much anymore. Maersk is one of uh, huge supporters of IMD. They are all over this. Yeah? Um, yeah, that will really affect this. And so the question going forward, what is your strategy for uh, a world with more uh, regulation, because we're going to see more regulation. Um, and why are the regulators so uh, aggressive? Because we are not doing enough. Uh, they are so aggressive because uh, uh, yeah, the CEOs don't have the right incentives to do stuff, 
And uh, so they look at short-term profit. Uh, we saw this with Mira. Mira said it's all about the energy crisis, the huge energy prices. And not only that, do we even get energy or do we have to close down? Yeah, and yeah, I'm, I stayed away from the really big problems Mira saw. I go to the smaller ones, namely inflation, yeah, higher import uh, uh, price or uh, input prices, uh, and uh, supply chain bottlenecks. Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much, Carl. It has been an impressive presentation, as always. Um, I'm, I'm listening, I'm listening. I'm listening. I, I'm just uh, yeah, leaving this here for okay. Heimer so that he can click too. <laughs> yeah, you need a clicker, I right? Would like, I would like to ask you if, if a good summary of your presentation is uh, you have to get first uh, geopolitics right to get the economics uh, working. Mm. Is that is that uh, what you what you mean? Um. Ah, thank you. Um, unfortunately, yes. So uh, I, I I don't have time to go into this. Uh, is that how do we think from an economics viewpoint of what happens climate change in, with climate change? I told the story about the negative externality, CO2 is bad, we are producing it when we produce a wonderful product of cement, that's a negative side effect and so the regulator could come in. There's a different story. For those of you who have some game theory, yeah, the tragedy of the commons, where we have a common good and all of us take advantage of this common good and are we taking good care of this? Uh, this goes back to the, the Nobel Prize of, for the first woman in economics to win the Nobel Prize, Eleanor Ostrom, about managing the commons. There do exist solutions for this. Actually, she got the Nobel Prize for a lot of case studies. One case study is farming in, around Valencia and how the farmers share water supplies. And you can do this. Uh, we Overfishing is a great example. Yeah? When we overfish the ocean, everyone can go there and we can't agree, you take a, a ton of fish, I take a ton of fish. No, we're greedy, everyone takes 10 tons and we kill it. So there are ideas for collective action. I was at the WEF in Davos and the big topic this year was, can't we all get together privately, private enterprises and agree we all increase our costs and operate greener. Ostrom's approach works locally, like farming in Valencia, like cows grazing in Switzerland on a common pasture, but on a global level, we can't get there. And so therefore, the heartbreaking story is, you are right. I wish you were wrong, but, and so then we are back to Mira, it says, oh, look at Russia, China, US, they can never agree on anything. And that's why we're not making enough progress. And that's now why we're going to three degrees Celsius. And uh, uh, it's too bad we're on camera here. Um, I'm heavily criticized for being so pessimistic. If you ask the depressed German Catholic guilty person, male in me. <laughs> White. White, white, yes, uh, we, are, we are screwed. We're, we're not going to do it. Sorry, the young people in the back, it's over. Uh, now, I'm not allowed to do this because at IMD we sell solutions and hope. And so uh, <laughs> we need more government regulation. We need more private enterprise. We need more innovation mm -hmm. to do this. We need innovation races. Uh, in order to solve the problem. Thank you very much, Carl. I would like to ask you f just for one question, and the rest of them, uh, uh, we will do it uh, at the panel. So, the first hand over there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ljubica, um, MBA uh, 2015 from IMD. Thank you for the presentation. 
Um, I come from, well, I work at the moment in life science and medical device industry. I can second all the concerns that the uh, CEO have and those that I don't. I think <coughs> what the crisis over the last few years has exposed is that innovation and sustainability kind of went out of the window in the, in the rankings of priorities. But you also mentioned that um, self-regulation is not to be expected from the CEOs or shareholders, so it's not going to be imposed, self-imposed, right? And then external regulation has also been proven inefficient or maybe difficult to, to be accepted, like C, C, yeah. So I was just wondering, so what is the solution? How, do we, how can we actually put those sustainability KPIs? And if we don't have a solution for that, how do we put back the innovation KPIs for our CEOs? You see, because there is no solution, that's why I'm so depressed about it. Uh, but, um, so, uh, yes, regulation is not the best way, but we are all not doing enough. And so what we really would need would be horizontal collaboration among competitors. The, the technical term in economics is pre-competitive collaboration. Let's say you and I, we are competitors. Um, and so, however, we get together and say, we're going to change the rules of the game. It's not about the one who has the lowest cost wins, but yeah, there is a level, a technological, whatever, a level of emissions that we agree to. And then we go back to competition. That's how it should be, and that would be real private initiative. But then, of course, I have the incentive to behind your back to cheat on you. And you have the incentive behind my back to cheat on me. So setting up this system is kind of complicated. Homework for everyone in the room, read the ideas of Elinor Ostrom. She has eight design principles. Last October, there is a, an HBR article, Homework Reading, by Knut Hanes, my colleague from IMD, together with Peter Tufano, and a PhD student who did all the work. <laughs> this is a tragedy. I remember the name of the two professors, but don't remember the poor guy who did all the work. Uh, Peter Tufano is a former head of the Said Business School, Oxford. No, uh, he was at Oxford and he was a head of Harvard Business School. The problem there is that the lawyers come in and say, you and I cannot talk to each other because we, maybe we are doing price fixing. No, this is what the article, yeah, the person before you, yeah, um, you were laughing, yeah? but the problem is, this is now what I hear. People are afraid to talk to each other. Oh, they're price fixing. And so, and the European Union regulation or on antitrust is very stringent. So people have told me, I, I've talked to people at, at IMD, sorry, I'm pitching IMD so much, but I like this, yeah? We have so-called executives in residence. Yes, so senior leaders who then want to give back to, to the MBA and EMBA uh, students. And we have this executive, uh, um, executive in residence who worked for Paul Polman at Unilever. And he said, people don't trust each other. Yeah, if I come to you and say, let's work together, you think, oh, they made an innovation. They already can work at this. They want to steal steal uh, market share from us. That's why they're suddenly so green. Carl was always this brown moron and now he plays green. Oh, he must have had a trick. So you don't trust me? And we are both afraid of the lawyers and going to prison. And so we would really need a framework for horizontal collaborations. These frameworks exist but are largely used for greenwashing. There's a vanilla initiative, there's a palm oil initiative, where, P where entities trying to do this, it's ma mainly for greenwashing. So, but that's what really would, yeah, we would need to apply the Ostrom stuff to in industries. And the other problem, I think what's so difficult here is that climate change is incredibly difficult and so, the oil industry is different than cement, is different than aluminum, is different than medical devices. There is no one size fits all. We, you really would have in different industries, you would need different agreements, different solutions. So you, we would have to do this everywhere. And why should I do that to you, with you? 
yeah, um, if my KPIs don't reward me for that. Having said all of this, there is an agreement between the eight leading business schools in Europe where we have this. We compete in executive programs against IMD, against IE and YESA yeah, here, but there's something called Business Schools for Climate Leadership, BS, bad word to start this with, yeah, but you can look it up, BS, the number four, CL, B, B, business, school, for SL, and so Peter Tufano who, uh, and Knut who pushed this said we are now collaborating on research but we are not collaborating on programs and there's no price fixing. I'm not going to go to IE tomorrow and say hey, you pri higher price, our price higher so the MBA students pay more everywhere. We're not allowed to do that. Yeah, and so we are trying to live this, yeah, and, and then there's the French schools, as you say, INSEADs and UK schools are in this. So that's what it takes, but it takes trust, it takes the right legal environment, a lot of effort. And then everyone has the incentive to cheat on each other. Yeah, and Ostrom, yeah, the farmers in the Valencia area, they're looking. If you were taking too much water out, uh, we're going to do something. Yeah? We're going to break your horse's legs or something. L literally, literally. They have these really funny setups there. Yeah? Um, so, therefore, sorry, to make a long story short, that's what it would take. And because it's not happening, the regulator steps in. And that's why we hate the regulator. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, let's move to the next presentation, the next and the, the final one from Jaime. Uh, and then we will have the panel. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you. Well, um, good evening. I have a really, really tough task trying to uh, continue with the, the discussion after this passionate speech. Uh, and I have a lot of uh, issues I would like to discuss uh, about the last presentation, but I want to just to, because I would like to talk about the CBAM, if it's really a, a cornerstone in the uh, European regulation I've been involved in the, the last four years in Brussels discussing about CBAN, CBAN yes, CBAN no, what's happening with that and so on. I used to be the former uh, um, chief of carbon markets in, in, in Repsol. Our first trade of carbon, of a ton of carbon, uh, five euros, was in the 2nd of July in 2005. We were really happy on that, and um, we have discussed a lot about what's happening with carbon markets. We can discuss further about that. I was as well in the clean development mechanism in the in the panel uh, in convention uh, in in uh, United Nations, and we discuss a lot about technology transfer and if this works or not. But I would like just to say something about uh, if we have the 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 companies, we have the 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 right incentives to do the right things, okay? Um, my CEO has been in charge for the last 10 years, so it, it helps. And nowadays we are working on this bonus moment regarding 2022, okay? This is the annual moment in February that we have to go to our uh, uh, collaborators and colleagues and say, okay, you are going to have a, expense, a huge uh, bonus or not, or whatever, related to your performance during the last year. We had fantastic uh, results last year. I am in charge of the uh, refining and chemical division, and it has been one of the best years in our uh, uh, old history. Because different situations, one of them, is because the crisis, okay? When there are crises, if you are on there in the market, you have these incentives. It's going to be the year where we are going to have the smallest bonus in the history. And it's because has been, uh, we have the 35% of our bonuses stick 
to the environmental performance. And we have a challenge, we have a challenge uh, and, a, and a goal regarding emissions every year, and we haven't uh, overcome them, we haven't achieved them. So it's, we are having a very difficult time facing our colleagues saying, okay guys, this year we have these rocketed uh, financial uh, goals and results, but we haven't gone to have these incredible bonuses. So we are trying to work on that, okay? <laughs> Son of us. So when we are, when we talk, no, no, we don't talk anything. Uh, Okay, when we talk about uh, the energy transition, we have to talk about technology. We will come back on uh, And this is something that is really, really important. We have talked, we will talk about uh, what is happening regarding narrative, what is happening about the society, but we have to talk about where is the war regarding technology. You could have, yeah? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. We are in the in the moment. I'm try, I'm going to try to be the optimistic guy. Okay. In the panel, we are going to achieve that, because we are realizing that is it 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 is worthy. I mean. We have to, in the moment that we have to go to the uh, negative emissions, we are, uh, we are running out of the time. We is not the, the, the case of just to avoid emissions because renewables and so on. We have to do, we have to retire the emissions from the atmosphere. We have to capture, you can try to, when you cannot avoid emissions, like for example, in these horrible factories in China producing cement, you can try to capture that CO2 and to do something with that, and you can store it. So there are technology there. We have to have the right incentive in order to deploy that. And why I think that we are going to have this moment uh, regarding to deploy that is because, we, is because it's going to be a competitive issue in the future. If you have the right uh, incentive regarding technology, you will have a really big, huge uh, incentive to be a different in the market. When we said, okay, we have this problem regarding uh, Ukraine, we have this crisis, we, have, we cannot rely on uh, uh, energy and supply of gas and oil from Russia, we said in Europe, okay, we are frightened about that, it's going to be a delay, or we try to do something further. And we, sa we have this 55 moment. You, I don't know if you, all of you are familiar with that, but we said, okay, maybe it's a moment to think about the CBAM, and it's a good moment to put on, uh, in charge of that, but at the same time, we have to be more autosufficient regarding energy. Because in the past, we have been uh, very, very dependent on energy. In the, we are the only big superpower that we don't have producing energy but our, uh, ourselves. Uh, the USA, China, uh, Russia, and so on, they have a lot of energy, and they can uh, support all of the development on that. Europe, they, we don't have that energy, and the only way that we can produce that is through nuclear or through renewables. So we said, okay, why don't we have to use more renewables? But there is another big bet on that, that is hydrogen. And the hydrogen can leverage the field between the other superpowers and uh, European uh, uh, Union. US, they had a very, very, uh, they have a very, okay, a schizophrenic, and I, I fully agree with this, a very schizophrenic approach regarding climate change. In some parts of the, uh, European, uh, the US, they say, okay, like California, they have, for example, and Californian uh, emission markets, I would say more strict than uh, the Europeans one. 10 years ago, we tried to link both markets in order to give deeper and to be more, uh, uh, to have more uh, allowances on that, but we cannot do that because they had a so, so 
difficult regulation regarding where the emission has been produced, here, 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 that was a nightmare to follow and track the emissions. So for the European uh, Union was, okay, we have to simplify the market and we are going to try to keep simple. But on the other hand, in the US, you have these kind of situations where, for example, there are companies like Exxon that they say, okay, we are not going to do a lot about climate change in order to avoid that, but maybe we can do a business with that, capturing all the CO2 and transforming all of our massive infrastructure between producing C uh, uh, oil to uh, capture the CO2 from everyone. They pay a fee for us. We transport this CO2 in our pipelines and we pump underground uh, in our reservoirs, and we can do that in a massive way, in a very affordable uh, price, and in a very quick way. We could try to avoid emissions in a very massive, in a very quick way in some uh, regions in the world. And we have these kind of different feelings about that. For example, the European Union doesn't like carbon, carbon capture and storage. I don't know why. Well, I could uh, guess why, but we say, okay, we, cannot, we don't want to do that. Only we will do that in Norway or UK because they have this possibility to have this infrastructure. But we, quite, we would like to do, for example, pushing another uh, 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 technologies. China, they do everything what they need to do at this moment and in the future. They have been uh, building a very, very bo a strong bond in the African markets for the last 15 years in order to buy every piece of earth or land in order to be provided by uh, metals, in order to do all the batteries of the world. 87% of the batteries in the world, Japanese, Korean, and European batteries are manufactured there. I have an iPhone. My iPhone is manufactured in China. They have the technology to do all the monetaries in the world. And we, as Europeans, give them that technology 20 years ago, when all the OEMs, mainly G Germany OEMs, they moved to them. Where they moved to there in order to say, okay, we are going to sell a lot of cars, because there are so many citizens here that we are going to have a very big business. And the Chinese people say, okay, come here, but you have to give us the R&D of some of a piece of your business. And they, at that moment, they say, okay, we'll give you something that is very tiny, like the uh, battery cars. And they began to grow and grow and grow. Some uh, Japanese and Korean companies from mobile, mainly, they give as well the manufacturing of batteries and the Chinese uh, government realized that the mining was going to be the next oil sector, and they began to buy all the rights to have these uh, strange, weird, has you rare metals, and the providing of that, and the supply for the next 30 years. Nowadays, we know that this is a strategy issue in European, and we are going to go he uh, there in Africa, in Latin America, in Chile, and wherever, and we realize that they have these contracts for the next 30 years, like LNG 20 years ago. Uh, India, India is a really, really very, very funny guys. They do everything, <laughs> everything that they need to do. We were talking that one of the ways to do the right things is the incentives, but the other one is why we don't try to build up a new market, a new market like, for example, the waste. If we provide a price to the waste, we could try to do something with that. If you just throw up the waste and you don't do anything with that, okay, it's a problem, anything else. Yesterday, we trade at 25,000 uh, tons of waste uh, of uh, oil uh, from India because they are using this uh, oil that has been used, for example, in the Burger King or in the McDonald's and they are beginning to trade that to the world. And we are looking and watching that is emerging a new market of this kind of waste in order to transform that to something, okay? So 
I am a little less optimistic because if something happens there, we could see that something that has been a problem, it becomes a source of a new energy. If it happens, Europe could have a chance because we could have the opportunity and the technology to, dis, uh, uh, to have this detachment from the habitual or current uh, commodities of energy. And we have the, the people, and we have the citizens, and we have the opinions, and this is really important. If we think what is happening regarding uh, nuclear, you could see, okay, Maybe it's not so bad uh, regarding climate change. Okay, you could have some kind of problems regarding safety from time to time, and you could have some problems with the waste. It's okay. But if you see all the history of the nuclear power and the nuclear technology during the last 40, 50 years, you could say it's more or less reliable, and you could have a chance regarding CO2 emissions. No government in Europe will face a situation like that, only, only uh, France government. And they are having their times trying to do that. You know that during the last summer, they have these problems regarding uh, the, the cool, cooling their reactors because they couldn't do that, extracting the water from the rivers because the, the, the temperature. And we are, they had this problem. So the NIMBY situation, the NIMBY uh, um, opposition is real. We are, bega we are be uh, beginning, we have a very big division of renewables in the in Repsol, for example, and we are beginning to see this kind of rejection regarding renewables. We don't want to see solar or, uh, or uh, wind uh, uh, close to my house. I don't want to see that. I have this ma uh, uh, manifest or whatever. People say, no way, do whatever you want, not here. And we have, at the same time, to provide the people their standard of life. And we will talk about population, because we are becoming a lot of people in this earth. One uh, thousand of million of people in this earth nowadays, they don't have access to electricity. Eighty thousand uh, hundred of pe uh, million of people, they don't have access to water. Every year, every day, they have to walk no less than five kilometers in order to get water. And we are talking about climate change. So we have to try to uh, embrace uh, both issues. When we talk about uh, uh, regulation, uh, and we say, okay, we will see more regulation. I say always, please, no more regulation. USA invent, China copy, European Union uh, regulate. That's it. We regulate, that's great. We have a lot of lawyers and people and politicians saying, okay, this, this, this. Just one single regulation. One, carbon price, carbon price, carbon price. But you have carbon price, you have the press, you have the VATs, you have uh, all the regulation regarding all the pollutants, all the contaminants, and sometimes of them, they are really, really uh, uh, contradictory. You need a map in order to know how to apply different regulations, and nowadays we are going to have the CBAM. You have, for example, to assure that some shipping from China, Vietnam, Malaysia, they have complied with a regulation regarding LCA, life cycle analysis, when they go to the uh, taxes and, and, and the port, and you have to see, well, that they are doing that. It's going to be a mess. It's going to be very difficult. But on the other hand, there are a lot of regulatory and, for example, investment uh, institutions that they are asking for this kind of regulation. Every quarter, we have to uh, apply and we have to report our uh, uh, numbers and our figures under this kind of uh, standards. And they ask us, okay, you need to give us more and more and more disclosure on that. And we have to do that. And this is no Greek washing. We need to do that because if not, we cannot lend money. We cannot borrow money in the markets because they are under the taxonomy and they don't give money because they think that you are not going to give, uh, you are not going to be able 
to return this money in the future because your uh, business is not going to be sustainable. So we have a lot of people working under this kind of dis uh, uh, disclosures. And this is the, 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 this is the second equation, no more, okay? <laughs> it was the first one and this is the second one. CO2 emissions, demography, people. If we are uh, nine billion people in the world, we cannot do anything regarding that. The Chinese try to do that, just single, a single uh, son, a single daughter, okay? But they say, okay, we have failed, we are getting aging and so on. So demography, we are more people in the world. Second, we, oh, sorry, we want to, to, we, we want to have a, a high standard of life. We want to move, we want to travel, we want light, we want everything. Nine billion of people. We want to eat every day, at least three times. We cannot do anything regarding that. So what we can do? We can do something regarding energy intensity. We can produce the steel producing less CO2 emissions. That's technology. That's a lot of technology. Is where the war is. Technology, semiconductors is there. Uh, the technology regarding to produce all this steel. Uh, and carbon intensity, how we try to produce as well, technology as well. So we have energy intensity, carbon intensity, and if we cannot avoid the emission of, two, of CO2, carbon capture. We can try to, to capture the CO2 and do something with that. We can try to store it, we can use wherever, and try to do this kind of net cycle where you don't uh, add more CO2 to the atmosphere. So it's technology mainly. Which kind of technology? Depends on the industry. Depends of if you want to do something, we will talk about that. Or buildings, that is the always last uh, guy in the classroom. I mean, there are a lot of things to do regarding buildings. We are wasting a lot of energy in buildings and we are not doing anything on that. We are building uh, sky rockets in the middle of desert. We are. Uh, uh, producing a lot of uh, cement, but at the same time we are trying to uh, get energy there because we have to keep cool or uh, heat, and we are spending a lot of energy on that. Renewables, we have to do a lot. The switch from coal to natural gas has been during the last, I would say, 30 years, okay? Uh, we have a lot of coal, as it has been mentioned in, in Germany and so on, but it's, this is not technology. This, it has, had, it has to happen now. Solar and wind. We have to have a lot of wind in the, in the, in the, in the seas, in the oceans. We have to have a lot of wind. Uh, I, we discuss about that. I would say 50 meters, uh, 50 kilometers in the, in the earth. I mean, we have to extract more energy from the natural uh, resources. Um, energy storage. We have to try to do energy storage in same places. I mean, we have to try to uh, convert the hydrogen in energy storage. We have to try to use geothermal uh, uh, reservoirs. We have to try to use all of this in a massive way. Um, we have to try to buy energy management system. We have to use our electric cars in order to provide energy for our houses. We have to use this energy as well in order to produce energy and storage that for our offices and for other buildings. So we have to create these connections between the different systems in order to storage energy in thousands and thousands of devices that we have using this uh, uh, power, for example. In mobility, we have to try to uh, be familiar that the mobility is going to break down in the future. It's not going to be like now, I mean, you have gasoline or diesel, but in the future, depends on what are you going to use. We will see oil, but we will see hydrogen as well. We will use hydrogen in, for example, heavy duty. This kind of heavy uh, uh, lorries or trucks that they go through all Europe or all US, they could be loaded by hydrogen, green hydrogen. Or we could try to use advanced biofuels produced from waste, produced from uh, garbage, produced from biomass. If you go to Google and you put, uh, you try to introduce Neste, you talk about uh, uh, the 
Finlands, they are really smart guys. They are really innovative. This Neste is the most innovative refining company in the world. And they are producing SAF, sustainable air fuels, from wood. From wood, because what did happen with them? They go 20 years ago, and they say, okay, we are really jealous, because we see our neighbors, Norway, they are rich, they are rich, and we don't have anything, because we don't have oil. What we, do, what we have? A lot of uh, forest, a lot of wood. And they began, little by little, to produce a new technology that converted linear cellulosic in a kind of, I would say, oil. At the very beginning, it was really, really expensive. Two months ago, they uh, signed uh, a MO with Delta, the airlines, in order to provide them SAF. They are the biggest provider of SAF in the world. They are getting rich because they invest in technology. It's the only way to try to do business with this. It, uh, be a different in this kind of world. You will see this, you will see uh, advanced uh, biomass and power. And you, we, I, I'm, not, I'm not a bit, uh, we put electricity in the, in the Airbus, is, 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 is working on that. I am a bit, uh, uh, well, uh, reluctant to see that in the, in the, in the, in the airplanes will be uh, uh, electricity. I will see, maybe in the short term, uh, flights, but in the long term, Madrid, New York, I would say, okay, if there is a kind of battery uh, uh, plane, I would say, okay, I would like to go in the next one, okay? <laughs> so we are working in the garbage, for example, we have, been, we have done uh, no less than uh, 50 uh, trips with Iberia uh, to Nova York, Boston, uh, Washington, that there are zero emissions because it's, been, it's based in uh, biomass, for example. And we have the technology there. We are producing there. Yeah, we have just to have the biggest, in, that is the problem with a European, that is to do that industri in an industrial way. And you need this kind of time length to, to, to think. You need 10 years, six years, seven years, in order to invest in R&D, and after that to produce that industry that will give you the employees, the GDP, and so on. I guess that the CCUS will emerge as a massive competitive in the world. We are going to see uh, a lot of different markets produced because of this. I cannot reduce the emissions. I cannot, uh, because it's too expensive, too difficult, wherever. But, um, for example, there are some companies that they are uh, offering us this. They go, uh, we have a, a petrochemical facility in Cines in the south of Portugal. They, we have a cracker, a big cracker there, very competitive. And they are very, very intelligent guys from Denmark. They come there and they say, okay, no worry about, about the CO2. Don't worry about that. We can take that, we transport in a ship till Rotterdam, and we uh, put their storage there just for $55 per ton. You need to capture the CO2, 45. So more or less for 100 tons of CO2, you have your problems fixed. You don't have to think about that. We'll see a lot of minerals regarding that. We are seeing that, for example, this kind of big ships with empty cargos, because they go with uh, gas and they come back uh, empty, we'll see this empty that will come back with CO2. They are transforming these cargos in order to do these two ways trips. And we will see this kind of reductions because we, they will have this kind of guys will make business from a storage uh, CO2. And you have to forget. You can uh, fleet and ship your CO2, for example, to the Gulf of Mexico in the south of the US. And just a minute of publicity and that's it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the only way to, 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 to win this, cha this challenge is to be consistent. And to be consistent means mainly that you are coherent during a long time, okay? We, are, we were very, very crazy people, okay? Uh, and we have been really thinking that this is going to be an opportunity for a long time. And for example, in 2003, we were the only 
and unique oil and gas company. We are a very small oil and gas company. When you are comparing us with our peers, like Shell, Saudi Aramco, and all of these very big guys. So because of that, because we are a very small big company, as we say, we the uh, crazy things. One of them is what we think that the Kyoto Protocol, where is the Kyoto Protocol? We said at that time, that's great. We need to support that. It was really, really very controversial. Every oil and gas company blame us. Everyone saying, hey guys, what are you doing? This is again us. Because we thought at that moment that we need this kind of changing time in order to do something different. We have been working in different issues. And for example, we began to have this kind of narrative trying to avoid the greenwashing. Trying to say, OK, we are doing this. We have, for example, our long-term incentives, this kind of incentives and bonus in order to have this retention and say, OK, if you stay with us in the next three years, you will be paid a lot of money. It's not a lot of money, but well, it's a good, a big, uh, it's a good uh, sum. Well, 45% of this LTI is linked to CO2 emissions. The CO has the 45% of its uh, 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 long-term incentive linked to that. So you have the right incentives in order to do that. They are asking, what is happening with the energy efficiency? Today, no, today no. On Monday, we went to the, to the board in order to approve uh, eight, a 70 million, uh, 70 million, uh, euro, a million of euros because we are going to replace in gas for electricity in one of our crackers. It will be produced 2003, uh, 2003 uh, 23 is today, in four years. We have this uh, to Siemens, they have to produce these very big uh, engines, and they will dispatch us in 2026. We have to stop the petrochemical facility in order to put these engines four years ahead. We have been approved on Monday. We have to think on that uh, in this kind of times length, because if not, we don't have uh, the advantage. And I don't want to, 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 to talk about all of the different uh, key metrics that we are following and so on, but this is important in order that it's OK. There are a lot of blah, blah, blah there. There is a lot of greenwashing there. But there are some serious companies talking about this. And there are, you have to follow the tracks. And I, 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 am really, really, I, I really agree with that, that you have to try to distinguish. There are a lot of people talking about, OK, which is the carbon intensity? Which is are your really, really long-term uh, uh, goals? How are you going to achieve that? How you are answering to that? And when you don't achieve your goals, where are your answers? How are you going to fix that? Are you investing money on that? Which is the amount of money that you are investing in the energy transition? Is really a tiny amount? Or is really a significant amount in the change of your competitive and your uh, capex? And I think that this is OK. This is just the, the same CI and carbon intensity market and as we follow it. And this is our, our, our uh, commitment. And that's it. So thank you very much, uh, Jaime. Uh, a, a more positive view. And, and it looks like he, he has gone to your classroom, uh, Carl, and, and taken the lessons on, on, the, on the incentive side. So uh, anyone would like to put a question to Is your turn. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. I would like to ask you if you have right now any existing and working project on carbon capture, waste to energy, and waste to hydrogen working and um, here in Spain or in Portugal, as you say, if we can see something that they, that's very really happening. Uh, yes. <laughs> Well, uh, well, regarding hydrogen, we have a really, really, uh, uh, wow, big challenge in order to, to deploy. Uh, we are, uh, currently, we are the biggest 
consumer and producer of hydrogen in, in, in Spain. And I would say the third of Europe. Uh, we are convinced that the, the hydrogen will be a very, very good opportunity in order to do a lot of things. One of the very good things regarding the hydrogen is not only that you can store it uh, renewables, as well that you can try to transform this hydrogen in other things. Mainly methanol, for example, or for example, ammoniac, and that you can train transport. And with this methanol, you can do whatever you want. I mean, you can try to do that and transform that, for example, in, in polyolefins and all uh, another kind of chemicals that will be themselves uh, uh, green and zero emissions. And then we are uh, deploying uh, electrolyzers, uh, I would say, one giga in the next three years in the different petrochemical sites. We are uh, dropping the first oil, they would say the E fuel. I, do, I, I don't know if you're uh, familiar. Yeah, yeah, I'm into oh, the sorry. business. <laughs> okay. So that's why I'm asking you. <laughs> in Petronor, in our refinery that we have a joint venture with Saudi Aramco, we are uh, deploying there the largest uh, demo plant in the world in E fuels. We are merging. CO2 and, uh, and hydrogen, and we are going to produce e-fuels, uh, that is zero emissions, in 2014, uh, sorry, uh, 2024. And that is going to take a lot, uh, uh, some time in order to do, for example, and to provide that for the, for the planes, because you know that, for example, you need to be one year with one engine working in order to homologate that fuel. Okay, so we will, but we have that, we have hydrogen, we have an eco plant, we have a gasification plant in 2025 where we are going to um, re reduce all the waste of Barcelona in Tarragona. And we are going to produce um, uh, advanced biofuels. Or in September, we are going to uh, put uh, in March uh, the biggest facility of advanced biofuels in Cartagena about carbon capture? Well, carbon capture is why we are a bit lagging on carbon capture. Because as you know, uh, in some countries they are more or less, they love or not the carbon capture and storage. In Spain they don't love that. They don't like that. Uh, but we are working on that because maybe we have to uh, export this uh, carbon with this carbon instead of storage here in Spain. Or, or transform it. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Uh, but you know that you, you depend, this is, well, this is a tricky question, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm. Why, why is a tricky question? Because this is, this is like a, we are in Europe, okay? In Europe, you go there and you say, okay, I'm capturing CO2. That's good, no? No. <laughs> no. Depending on where are you capturing. If, for example, you are doing a, one of the things that when you are using, you are using these steam reforms, okay, you are producing uh, hydrogen that we are producing now, ourselves, and liquid, Plaxair, all these big guys, uh, you crack the, the natural gas, you crack that, and you produce this hydrogen at the same time that you are producing CO2. And you are emitting the CO2. And you could say, okay, maybe it's a smart way to reduce the emission of CO2, to capture the CO2 and use that in order to do something with that. No. So no, Not in Europe. Not in Europe. No, in, all the, well, in, in the rest of the world, yes, here, no. And this is the colors of the, of the hydrogen. I don't know if you are familiar with that. Blue, green, purple, <laughs> all of this pink, whatever, okay? So the blue one is when you capture the CO2 from a fossil fuel. And for example, Saudi Aramco is going to do thousands and thousands of millions of whatever doing this blue hydrogen. We are not thinking about that. We are thinking about a uh, green hydrogen. But regarding capture, we are going to try to do fossilize that, mineralize that. We are, we are going to do is use this CO2 and to produce stones, okay? And for example, uh, uh, carbonates. That's it. <laughs> the problem with that is quite expensive nowadays. And we have to thank thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Jaime. I would like to invite Mira and Carl just to join us for a final panel.
So it, it, it has been great just to have all you here and, 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 and seeing your presentations. Uh, le, 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 let's, let's just do it when, okay. <laughs> no, the, the problem is that we can only have two working at the same time. Um, it, it has been great just to have all you, you here and sharing your thoughts, your ideas, your experience. Um, I would like uh, to ask you to do something. It's just, I am sure that each of you have been, uh, have a question for the other panelists. When you have seen the other presentations, I would like to start with you, Mira. What would you like to ask to, to Carl and to Jaime? I would like I would like to ask uh, Karl about the German model. <laughs> In the end, he's German, and uh, how he see how do you see the ability of Germany to adapt itself for this new geopolitical context? And above all, the question is about: Is there any danger? Uh, of desindustrialization because of the energy crisis. Uh, because uh, uh, from, from American point of view, one of the, mm, of the main worries in the United States is the possibility of desindustrialization in Germany, and as Germany is a driver of the European <laughs> Union, could have a, a lot of consequences. So what is your opinion? You are German. And uh, you talk about the guilty uh, German uh, roots and so on. So it's your <laughs> moment now. <laughs> um, one of the big regrets I have is that when uh, the German government 20, 25 years ago really cozied up to Russia, uh, I predicted that one day Russia would turn off the energy to Germany. I was against this Nord Stream nonsense from the beginning. I didn't write it down because all my friends thought yeah, that that's not politically correct. That wasn't politically incorrect before we knew that terminology. So I'm extremely mad at myself because I could have finally had a paper that people now need to cite. Yeah. Oh, this car guy knew this 25 years ago. Um, so yes, uh, Germany is short on energy, but uh, the one issue that came up also in your talk is demography. We don't have enough workers. Uh, Germany is extremely short on workers, and because of the German guild, we take just anyone. Um, and so this is what America is good at, and Switzerland is also good at this. In America, because of the lack of a social system, you only want to move to the United States if you're willing to work your ass off, if you're willing to work day and night. Now, uh, the people from Central America are willing to do this. So a dear friend of mine has several big farms in California, and he loves the Mexicans. He says, yeah, they, on Sundays they go to church, and the rest of the week they milk my cows. Yeah, and they all just want to drive cars, and they want to send their kids to school. So, uh, and, and so you have this extreme focus. You only want to move to the US if you're willing to work your ass off. Uh, a lot of people come to Germany for the social net. Uh, and so Germans don't, f Switzerland for example, they force people to learn German or French or Italian. Germany is all hands off because of the guilt feeling. So we have these huge ghettos of Syrians and, and other uh, refugees who, are not, who cannot participate in the workplace. Uh, so in addition to lack of energy, there's lack of uh, uh, workers. BASF, for example, has uh, sh uh, threatened to lay off 30,000 people in the Ludwigshafen area and move elsewhere. So I don't know whether this is sort of playing and trying to, uh, uh, to blackmail the politicians, but the danger is there. Um, so uh, I, I don't have the crystal ball, so I don't know. But uh, uh, yes, I think we need Spain and other countries to step up and do more energy uh, and do more uh, work. Yeah? Yeah. So it's, it's, no, Germans don't have enough uh, children. Same with Italy. Yeah? We have huge demographic problems. And I think uh, we see this now in the job market. 
um, that uh, and now in addition you had this great resignation after COVID. So I think there's a real lack of uh, labor in countries like Switzerland, Germany, to the US to some degree too. You have three and a half percent unemployment in the US is, is unheard of. Yeah, and, and this is a big, big uh, problem that the Republicans, I never hear talk them. Yeah, they want to be all pro-business, but the businesses need labor. And then you have to either legalize the immigrants or allow more of them. So that's a big discrepancy in that. Yeah, and I think it's very different. The Spanish issue with your huge youth unemployment is very different than the problem that we face in, in some other countries. Yep. And my question... Uh, yeah, I didn't answer it because I don't know the answer, so that's why... <laughs> but there's, there's I try to become a politician in my old age. Yeah, You ask, you ask A and I answer B. <laughs> yeah. No, my, my question for Jaime is... The, the war in Ukraine and energetic crisis uh, shows mm, two very stupid things about uh, the European Union energetic policy. The first one is the uh, huge exaggerated dependence on the, on the Russian uh, energy, and the second one is the lack of useful uh, interconnections uh, for uh, in, um, uh, among the European uh, member state countries. So in Spain, we have uh, five centers for this gasification, but we do not have good interac uh, interconnections with another uh, countries of the EU. So uh, how Spain could be useful in this uh, energetic crisis, I mean not only Repsol, but Spain <laughs> as a country. So uh, I mean, we can can these centers for the uh, this um, gasification could be useful for Europe, really, or how we can do that? Well, <clears throat> we have not only the five ga gasification facilities, but as well two pipelines from Argelia. At the beginning of the crisis, uh, Europe, uh, European Union realized, hey guys, the only pipelines for other countries that are not Russia are for Argelia. And we have both of them. We are the most flexible uh, gas provide country in Europe. We have been paying a lot for that. And why we have this problem in, in Europe? Because we have these kind of barriers that they are geostrategical. I mean, uh, the France people, they say, okay, no, the France people, the France government, the US strategist says, okay, we don't want to try to cross this, but not only regarding gas, but also, also with uh, electricity, power, and whatever. And then you are a uh, lack of, uh, for the for European Union, of the one of the arms that they are most reliable regarding renewables, because in Portugal and uh, uh, Spain you could have a lot of renewables, a very cheap way, in order to provide energy for the rest of Europe. And you don't, don't have that, because you have this kind of cuts in the middle of the Pyrenees. So if we don't face this kind of strategic issues, it will be difficult for uh, Spain to provide energy to, to, the rest of, uh, to the rest of the European Union. So we will have a kind of problem with that. Excellent. Jaime, would you like uh, uh, a po positive view on the future? Perhaps Carl has a negative one. Can you ask him a question? On your Regarding pessimistic. Okay, <laughs> no. <laughs> I would like to ask something because we have been a controversial issue regarding what is bet be uh, better, a tax or a, a carbon markets. And there is a tricky one. I mean, the European Union uh, uh, choose uh, uh, the, the, the carbon markets, because it looks like there is some kind of economical theory behind that mm -hmm. that says, okay, you try to find which is the best uh, price in order to implement your technology. At the end of the day, when you have a cap of the price, you say, okay, I have this price of the technology, I implement that or not, or I buy for the CO2. If you have a tax, when you have a tax, this is like a nightmare, you have the tax. You cannot do anything regarding that. So what do you think that is better like a mechanism in order to try to uh, avoid emissions? The taxes or the carbon markets? 
very good question. Hmm. So, so one thing I learned tonight, uh, uh, Fernando is brilliant. If I ever have to uh, uh, manage a panel, yeah, and I no longer stress about questions. I, I, I make them <laughs> yeah, ask questions. So, that's very clever. Yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, <laughs> theory says markets are really good at determining prices. So that's really good. So the European Union went with the emission trading system where we say, okay, we limit the pollution and then we can control the pollution and, and give fewer and fewer permits and push pressure and then drive up the prices. Mm -hmm. The problem with these emission trading and cap and trade system is to get them off the ground. So the price in the European Union for a long, long time was too long, yeah. was too low. And so to calibrate an emission trading system is really tricky and so therefore now practical economists uh, say a carbon tax is a better way to go you just set a price everyone pays and then you do it this way so this is for example why in this opinion piece from the wall street journal that i showed all these people recommended a carbon tax because it's easier to implement uh, and it hurts me to say this, but I am afraid they may be right. <laughs> um, uh, no, because I agree with you that the, the, the cap and trade system ha has sort of more of a charm. So uh, then I, yeah, as a politician, as trying to become a politician, not just kidding, um, uh, you criticize that we have too much regulation. The problem is with regulation in place me means always there are these institutional details. Yeah? What does it actually mean? Yeah? And you get the lawyers involved. And so, therefore, I agree with you that a lot of regulation is an utter nightmare for companies to implement and, and go through the paperwork, and Brussels comes up with crazy paperwork. Uh, so on the implementation side, I agree, and that maybe a CBAM may be an utter nightmare. But because there's this lack of collective action in many industries, that's why we have it. But I agree with you that we need simple and powerful uh, um, regulation. Uh, then to your question on the uh, uh, carbon capture. There is this dream that carbon capture is sort of the super solution. I want it to be true as well. Um, I don't know whether that's true. Yeah? I learned a lot tonight here, but in Switzerland, uh, the public opinion is that the leading technology in the world is by a company called Climeworks yeah. out of Switzerland. No? Huh? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, carbon capture and sequestration. And you can go there and capture this. Yeah? I looked at the price. Yeah, and now it looks again, I'm not walking the talk. Yeah, it's a thousand Swiss franc a ton. And then I said, nah, 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 I'm not going to do that. Yeah, so uh, right now you're paying 100 euros. Uh, yeah, so this is the leading technology. So price, it's way too expensive and it takes too much uh, energy. Currently, they do this in Iceland and they can do 5,000 tons a year. Do you remember the big number for the exam? 36 billion. So they got now 600 to 650 million in startup money, and their dream is to go from 5,000 to a million. Let's make it 5,000 to 5 million. So that needs to a factor of a thousand. And then it's still peanuts because then we need another thousand. So I love these stories about carbon capture, but we have a long way to go. Yeah? So Okay, so uh, how much do I have to pay? Can you 800? Can you beat 800? I will talk to that guy when we finish it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Well, I have two comments regarding that, if, if I may. One of them is uh, regarding this climate works. It's, it's, it's a very good uh, uh, company. Uh, they are capturing the, the CO2 not from the uh, source. It's not from a chimney, it's not from a furnace, it's from the atmosphere. They move tons of, tons of, uh, of air in order to capture the CO2. The order is that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is so tiny 
so small that you need to move a lot, a lot of uh, air in order to do that. And it's true. They are capturing a very, very small quantity today. But their business is not that one. Their business is, compet uh, is the competition against the other one. Is that the forest? Do you know that nowadays there is, they are called natural sinks? And there are a lot of investment funds that they are investing huge amount of money uh, in natural things. For example, uh, all the Ivy League, they are investing a lot of money in, in, in natural forests. But, but this, is, this guy says, these natural things, they have several problems. One of them, they can be uh, burned and they uh, refund all the CO2 that has been trapped in the forest to the atmosphere again. Or, for example, they need a lot of water. You need a water in order to, to have this forest. Or you need a lot of land. Or you need wherever, you need time in order to grow the forest. The guy says, why we don't implant this tree forest or tree or uh, technology trees, for example, in the desert, where there is a huge amount of space in order to do that. You have this huge and huge uh, funds uh, taking the atmosphere, extracting the CO2, and capturing that. Uh, it's true that now is there are just 5,000, but they are thinking about 1 million. We need at least 1,000 of 1 million or 10,000 of 1 million doing that in the Sahara. Why not? Why you cannot do that? Well, it will be a new market, and it could be people investing money on this kind of new markets, okay? This is one thing. The other one, SIBAM, is the really good uh, bet or not? I've, I've been in the, involved in this kind of discussions and I've seen, for example, European companies that they say, we don't want SIBAM. We don't want SIBAM because we are based in other countries outside Europe. We have high, we have here the hot waters, the fancy, uh, road soaps and whatever, but the facilities where we are producing cement, for example, Lafars, where we are producing steel or whatever, is outside Europe. We want to import from these facilities to Europe without SIBAM. So I, in this case, I'm a bit pessimistic. I don't think that it's going to be a very good tool because the, there are a lot of European companies doing treaties on that. Carl, I am sure that uh, you would like to, to, to ask something about geopolitics to Mira, because geopolitics, <laughs> if geopolitics is right, then um, economics will work. Uh, that, that was the conclusion. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, how stable is China and the Chinese government? And uh, so they are there because they have a lot of pollution. And, and they have these huge problems. Is there any hope that you know, the damage changes the thinking there or maybe even you know, the, the way they do business? Uh, about the, the stability of the Chinese government um, after the meeting of the Congress of the Communist Party, Xi Jinping, uh, made uh, the, the main changes in, in his uh, closer circle of, of advisors and supporters and so on. And what we see, there are some changes, but uh, uh, he focused on, uh, of course, on the relationship between the United States and China. She named, he named uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, the guy who was the, the ambassador in the uh, United States, uh, definitely uh, one of the priorities of the Xi Jinping uh, government is the relationship with the United States. And he had a plan, but I think that this obsession with zero COVID and what happened later with the manifestation, demonstration on the streets of China, which is uh, since uh, Tiananmen, uh, co more or less not completely new, but surprising because uh, Chinese are obedient and, uh, and uh, really when they uh, got streets, that was really like a big deal for them. So I think that Chinese will not uh, forgive 
to Xi Jinping, a lot of debts, and his zero COVID policy. So he shifted mm, very, very fast, but I think that next Congress, <laughs> and definitely they will not uh, forget it and forgive him. So the stability of Chinese government in this political sense is uh, in this moment there is stability, but I think that in future this stability will be uh, less sure than Xi Jinping uh, would like. No. And about pollution, uh, I, I ask, uh, I will respond uh, about this question, uh, what my Chinese colleagues respond to me, I, I mean, and I, I think that they are right. Uh, they said that pollution, of course, is a, a big deal. They would like to participate actively in the climate change. They uh, have a lot of raw materials which are uh, needed for uh, uh, energy transition, so they will have a really huge role in future in energy transition. But they definitely said, we have priorities. We would like to cooperate with in climate change because this is a, a, a small room when we can cooperate with the West. We would like to be a part of the international order and so on, so on. But our priority is uh, industrialization, digitalization, and finally, uh, our internal development. So, because because is uh, this is priority, because for us is priority uh, to give a people uh, jobs, to maintain China, because there is a huge, huge difference between China, China on big cities like Shanghai or, or, or even Shenzhen. It is completely artificial <laughs> city, but, and of course, the countryside. So they think that is much impo important uh, industrialization and to create it, uh, jobs then to fulfill criteria of the climate change, Paris Agreement, and so on. This is just priority. It's not that they don't mind about climate change, but for them, because internal stability of China depends of development, internal development, and of course, uh, depends also this competition with the United States. So climate change, uh, all people talk about climate change and would like to fulfill it, but uh, I think that geopolitics always uh, will uh, uh, overcome all this expectation. So, thank you very much for the uh, question. Thank you very much. Uh, any question from the audience? Gonzalo, por favor. Thank you. Uh, very interesting uh, uh, conference. Thank you so much for to the three of you. I have this uh, just thought in a little bit when I was uh, listening to Professor Schmeras. Um, in the end, um, uh, do you think that Actually, all the all the uh, um, ESG, or at least the the the, the part of uh, of transitioning uh, and adapting to climate change, in the end, brings a, a kind of a regressive taxing uh, tax uh, on the society. In the end, who's paying for that? Who's paying for that? Uh, this is going to turn into inflation, at least as a jump in the price level. And if technology is not achieved, you're going to have uh, a trend in in uh, in the in the gr uh, growth in 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 prices over the over the time, and uh, if you adapt, you will end up tran uh, translate uh, translating those costs to the l bottom layers of the society who are transitioning from the fuel system that they have or the heating system they have in the houses, and they cannot do that. So that's why that kind of delves into the narrative that people then in, in lastly use to go against these kind of things because who is actually going to pay? I mean, I don't have a Tesla, but a Tesla is 70,000 bucks, 6,000 bucks. And who, you get it subsidized in the United States, in California. You get 10,000 10, bucks for a Tesla, but you have 60 other thousand bucks to buy a Tesla. If you are a, a milkman and you have a small van run with diesel, you, you're not getting any, any subsidies or comparative big enough subsidies to transition from your old van into a, 
Uh, I'm not questioning that, but in the end, all these transition to green technologies implies uh, a regressive tax on the consumers. And that's why that bodes the, the terrain, the soil, for, for people to go against it. So and that goes bodes well with the question about incentives that you were posting uh, in the very beginning. It's just I, I, I it's would not add, no, 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 I would add a question. Who will pay energy transition? <laughs> because we are talking a completely different model of economy, of capitalism, of geopolitics. Who will pay it? This is my question. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have until midnight? Um, okay. So, uh, excellent point. Um, this is why I'm so pessimistic um, and why we will fail. Because uh, who has to pay? You, you, and me. Yeah. Everyone in the room. We you are all the rich people. So, yeah, so this, this is you had on your slide uh, the yellow jackets. Yeah, I don't have, didn't have time to talk about this. Uh, great example, a case on point of what you just said. Macron had a great idea. Diesel, for historical reasons, has been taxed very little in France. Why don't we tax diesel higher? A higher cost so that we all use it less. Econ 101, exactly what these economists from the US say, we need a high carbon tax. Who gets hit the most from high energy prices? The poor. Because relatively speaking, a larger portion of their free income goes to food and energy. So they went on street and burned down Paris. Biggest riots in 50 years since this 1968 uh, student revolt. So now tragedy of the horizon comes in. Macron thinks, oh shit, there's an election coming up in two or three years. I'm going to lose this. They're going to vote for Le Pen. That's not such a great idea. So he folded within a couple of weeks and then the tax was taken back. So what we have is that this ESNG, that we give it one name, is nonsense. The E and the S are competitors. They work against each other. From my clients in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, I learned the critical term, the just transition. We are talking about the green transition. No, it's not a transition. It needs to be a just transition. And because uh, Macron's green transition was not just, it failed. So just transition, so this term comes from the labor movement in the United States from the 70s, the technology, more and more technology coming, killing jobs, and the labor unions. The labor unions are not green. The labor unions are worried about the current jobs. Yeah, so this is what they forget, the lefties, tree huggers in Berlin. Yeah? <laughs> so you have the social democrats and the green. It, they are constantly at each other's throat because the greens don't like the labor unions and the labor unions don't like the greens. So seriously, it, it's now the concept of the just transition. And so then what would we have to do? Okay, let's tax everyone and then give the tax income back to the poor only. So everyone in this room pays more, and to the poor unemployed young people in Spain, to the lower middle class that has to commute like crazy in, to Paris because they can't afford to live in Paris, they all get a rebate. But now we're talking about redistribution from the rich, to the poor, and now I sound like a commie, yeah? And now, no, seriously, so seriously, I have these discussions with participants at IMD, and so then we would have to give up, the rich would have to give up something to the poor. Now, we don't like to talk about this within the rich countries, yeah? but we only talk about, oh, we have to give something to Africa. Yeah? It's between rich Spain and Germany and poor Africa. We talk about this. Oh, there is this issue. But it's right here at home. Right here at home, we have the same problem. And unless we aggressively attack this, 
which we are politically unable to do, we're not making progress. You, your point is absolutely uh, well taken. And now here in Europe, yeah, we have fairly strong political parties on the left in the United States. They have a, this political system where the companies buy, their, buy the politicians. Yeah, so there the poor people get screwed. Here is something to think about. Life expectancy of white people in the US without a college degree has been decreasing. In the so-called richest country on earth, white people are get, without a college degree and increasingly black people too, but mostly white people, are getting screwed over because of NAFTA and all the outsourcing. Yeah? So you give them fentanyl and a lot of these opioid drugs, go and commit suicide, kill yourself. Yeah? No, seriously. And then give them guns to shoot each other. No, think about this. And so now, this is what your point is. What is the measure of well-being? You say it's GDP. Yes, I learned that too. And I teach that. But is it GDP? Or is it life expectancy and long life, healthy life with enough food and, and, yeah, so, and then we get into these really fundamental discussions and then, and we also have those at IMD, you have some young people who say green growth is an illusion. We need degrowth. And then you think, okay, I'm too old for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, back to Marxism? No, but okay, I, I'm getting sidetracked. Your point, to summarize, your point is excellent, yeah, but we are hurting the poor and then we're in redistribution. Are, are we willing to do this? Or do we get like the miracle innovation yeah, that saves us? Jaime, quería decir algo. Just two comments. One. Uh, while we have uh, subsidized for the last, I would say, 40 years, uh, the diesel in Europe, because technology, because we wanted to have a massive uh, penetration of the diesel, Germany, oh yes, that is not the case in USA. They have gasoline, so we were we have been subsidizing the technology from Germany in a well, I would say. Uh, a slightly way from the last four years, and nowadays we are changing that. Who is going to pay that? I fully agree with uh, Professor Carl, uh, all of us. You can pay that through, uh, as consumer, you pay a premium in every choice that you try to do, okay? This is green, this is zero, whatever, or you can do that as taxpayer. Uh, why we are so afraid about what we has happening in the U.S. regarding the IRA, the Biden uh, uh, incentive for this, because it's really quick. It's going to happen. You don't need to do overcome all the barriers that you have to face in European Union in order to have a, 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 an investment fund or whatever. You have to go to the IPCL, uh, new innovation fund, whatever, and you don't have the funds. You don't have the, the, the partes and whatever, this is a mess. There, you have only have to go to the taxpayer for the next year and you say, okay, I have, a do, I have deployed this green hydrogen, this capture or whatever, and you have uh, you, you take off from your, uh, uh, your declaration and that's it. It's quick and, it's, and so a lot of companies, they are going to go there in order to do this kind of green methanols and green investments because they're really, really cheap and very, very easy. I would like to, to put you uh, a couple of questions that, that have come on, online, and then if you don't have any more questions, yes, we will go for perhaps for a while. Um, <laughs> the, the one question from the, the audience online uh, was about some of the projects you mentioned, and it's tied up with uh, this uh, conversation. This part of the conversation is about sub subsidies. For the projects you mentioned, do they always require subsidies? <coughs> subsidies should be only uh, useful or should be used if you have to kind to grow off to scale up some kind of technology. If some of them are 
I would say a gigafactory of batteries, it shouldn't be subsidized. Because the technology is there. The TRL is nine, you are producing factory, you have these gigafactories in other countries, you know? Mm -hmm. You only should allocate, should allocate this kind of technologies if you want to push them in order to do and speed it up the process, okay? Because they are nowadays not profitable or whatever. But if they are, um, uh, yeah, in, in, in the, the only challenge is that you have to uh, choose the capes and so on, you don't need this subsidized. So the short answer is some of them are subsidized or we would like to be subsidized. The others, no, depends on. And the, and the other question is, uh, is about technology. <clears throat> and if the question is, if Europe can be uh, in the game and can produce new technologies that can be um, um, game changers, um, is Europe a place for producing that technology or we have to wait for the Chinese or the, or the Americans? I'm going to provide just a couple of examples. One of them is regarding electrolyzers. The five biggest uh, electrolyzers manufacturers in the world, well, in, uh, four of them are European nowadays. Maybe next year, no, because it has been uh, bought for other company, okay? But nowadays they are in the electrolyzer world. The other one is, for example, and we talked about that previously, uh, mini reactors. There are very, very, interesting uh, UK developments regarding this technology, and it could be a game changer, for sure. And it's in UK. And I think it's a problem of funding, of credit, of, of, of the way you fund projects, but is I, there a scale there? I fully agree. Uh, well, the main problem with that, yeah, I, 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 I fully agree with that. We have to keep the moment. I mean, the main problem with uh, in the European uh, industry is that we don't have the patents in order to cross the desert valley, okay? That it takes from TRL, technology readiness level that is six, when something is demo, but is not having been in industrial size, to TRL nine. And you ha the, the, the main problem is that when you will have to go to the board asking a lot of money for a not proof previously technology, mm -hmm. in order to scale up that, we don't do that in, in Europe. We only do that in US or other countries uh, because of you don't have the support in a massive way from the governments and the institutions. So, well, in the, nowadays, uh, Border Legend says, okay, we are going to push this support and so on. Well, we, we, we don't know if we are going to be there. Carl? Uh, yeah, so um, I think Europe can be a place. We have very good universities all over Europe. So the European Union should just put a lot of money into the education, also in vocational training. And then with respect to R&D, I think the, 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 uh, um, to give tax rebates on R&D cost is a proven way to really spur innovation. Uh, if if uh, if that's really attractive for companies, and so yes, we can do this because I think, uh, relative to the Chinese way of thinking, the the lack of freedom of thinking they have, this is really where we can compete, and we need to throw money at it. It's, it's will going to cost money, and so that's where government money uh, should go, and then even the big companies should get R and D tax rebates to to sort of make it really financially attractive uh, uh, for them. So we started just uh, five uh, uh, o'clock p.m. and now it's uh, uh, eight. Uh, Quarter past eight. So I think it is time just to, to finish. One short question. <laughs> very, please, very please, short. Please, please, please. Thank you. Thank you. So it's, it's really a short one. Could you please, the three of you, recommend a book to go deeper on the topic we are talking today about? Uh, <laughs> We can send, uh, uh, you can think on this and we can send them the... This is the, um, uh, the, the book of, the, the map of the world of uh, Jürgen, very famous, I, I have to, ch I have 
this book at home and I will send to, to Fernando the picture. And the book he published before the Ukrainian crisis, but describe how energy always is in the heart of geopolitics. I, I will send my recommendation uh, to okay. Fernando, but I have to, one of them is the quest. Okay, if you want to know anything regarding energy, you have to, to read this book. It's like the Bible, uh, the Bible uh, of Jagardin uh, is this one, and the other one is a Spanish one. It's from a professor from the study that is uh, Professor Colom, that it talks about this kind of hubs. Innovation uh, is called Universidades, Innovación e Industria. And it's really, really good. How we, you can try to nurture this way of doing things and to scale up innovations. I'm going to surprise you. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to surprise you with a really optimistic book, uh, and uh, that's Bill Gates, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, uh, or Climate Catastrophe, and uh, he is a total nerd, uh, so I think some of the stuff he recommends is uh, will politics won't allow it, but because he's such a numbers person and a nerd, for me it was really helpful, he looked at the various parts of technology and he says this is where we are this is where we need to be do you think we can get there and he's very sort of optimistic but he's sort of looking at these various numbers and so for example he really changed my viewpoint on nuclear energy uh, we need nuclear energy yeah. it's very unpopular to say that in particular in switzerland and germany we need nuclear energy uh, in the transition maybe yeah, uh, our great grandchildren won't need it anymore but for the time being we need it and this is why you see why germany is such an utter failure they have wonderful nukes that they all switched off and now they're burning coal and they feel good about themselves Ah, yeah, uh, because uh, what the Greens in Berlin have realized, yeah, they don't need any reactors because electricity comes out of the socket at the, in every building. What do you need nuclear reactors for? <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm just depressed. I need alcohol. <laughs> so, I, I promise. I promise you all that we will invite to a very good Spanish wine to Carl, and he will be more optimistic tonight. Uh, no, after listening to Jaime, I've, I've new hope. I have uh, okay, new hope now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I would like very much to, to thank to the Fundación, to Beatriz and Vicente, for all the, all the help for, uh, and supporting us, and also for uh, providing access to the, to the to their network of alumni. I would like also to, to thank to our alma mater, to the IMD, perhaps they are online, uh, uh, supporting us, to the Riders Club and, and all the business schools that have also this kind of activities and they share those activities with us. I would like to thank very much the three of you uh, for your time, for the effort of uh, being here. Um, and I would like also to thank you all attending here and all the people online. And that's it. Thank you very much and see you soon.